Tonight's umpires, Randy Marsh behind home plate. Dana DeMuth, the umpire at first base. Harry Winnelstadt, the umpire at second. And Dutch Renard, the umpire at third base. This ball game will be just about an hour late in starting. But most people right here are very happy that it is starting. So the fans are applauding. Leadoff batter Barry Larkin. Larkin hitting 311 so far this year. Last year he batted 244. And against Gooden, he has had three hits and ten at bats. No home runs, and he has not struck out against Gooden. He is number one in the National League in multi hit games, meaning two or more hits a game. He has had two or more hits a game in 12 of the games so far this year. And the fastball is struck. Gooden started this game with 33 strikeouts. He has struck out 10 or more batters in a ball game 37 times. And the fastball is strike two. Larkin with five home runs and 12 runs about an end. The Reds are running ball club. They lead the National League in stolen bases with 54. Larkin has 10 stolen bases. And the curveball, did he swing? First base umpire, Dana Namus, said he did not swing. So the count, one and two. A good place for the 0-2 curveball out of the strike zone. And it didn't appear that he went around. The next delivery by Gooden, a fastball hit on the ground through the hole, a base hit. So Larkin comes back, singles the left as the ball game is underway, and that'll bring up Chris Zabel. Aren't too many right-handed hitters that don't get around on a high fastball like this. This is vintage Gooden stuff. Barry Larkin, little top hand. That could be indicative that he's an inside hitter with a very quick bat. Good hitting. Sable, the batter, hitting 273, five home runs, eight runs batted in. He's had 12 stolen bases in 13 attempts. Against the doctor, he is 0 for 4 in his major league career. He is second in the National League in two base hits with nine. He's fifth in extra base hits with 14. Larkin has hit 14. Sable filling in for Buddy Bell, who's on the DL. And doing a fine job. Runner goes on the first pitch. No throw by Carter, and it's strike one. So the Reds immediately go into action as Larkin picks up a stolen base. Cincinnati with eight stolen bases last weekend, plus a balk against the Mets. They had six in one game off Sid Fernandez and waste no time. Stealing second off good. Stolen base number 11 for Barry Larkin. Puts a runner in scoring position. A one strike count to Sable. And Gooden back. Missing with a fastball. One ball, one strike. The Mets have had 20 consecutive scoreless innings from their pitchers. Ball pulled foul. One and two. Mario Soto, the starter in Sunday's game. Mario, not the pitcher that he was, but is still a very effective major league pitcher. Effective enough, as a matter of fact, to be the opening day pitcher for Cincinnati this year. And that great fastball and great changeup. He's had a few arm problems. a new ball. Well, this is tight and close. Sable ought to be used to those close shades. He was a goalie in hockey and a good one. <laughs> those are prescription glasses. He's been wearing those types of glasses for 15 years. Play on in second base. Double covering. 
Clark in the back end. Pretty have to work on the Cincinnati base runners because they will run. And a combination of speed and power. And right off the hands, a little ground ball to Keith. And Hernandez picks up the out as Larkin goes over to third. Broken bat ground ball. productive at bat in that he moved Larkin to third base with an out. So the value of putting the bat on the ball on the ground with a runner at second and nobody out puts Larkin at third and one out. And it brings up Cal Daniels. Daniels hitting 271, five home runs, 15 runs batted in. And against Dwight Gooden, he is one for four with a home run. number one in the National League in walks with 24. He's number four in on-base average with the 429 percentage there. Last year hit 334 for the Cincinnati Reds. 26 home runs. And the curveball foul strike two. Obviously remembering that 3-2 hook that he got to strike out last time. And that's what you got to do from series to series, at bat to at bat. Remember what you threw a guy, and Cal certainly appeared to be looking for the breaking ball there. And Paul O'Neill, the batter. O'Neill hitting fourth in place of Eric Davis. that has made good to stand out this year so far is his consistency with his breaking ball. Total confidence in the off-speed pitch. Fast ball, foul away, one and two. One ball, two strikes. with a plane flying over. I would imagine Pete probably watching the game, but not at the ballpark. He cannot come to the ballpark until the first part of June. With a runner at third and one out, Daniels and O'Neill strike out, and Gooden gets out of the inning. One hit, one left to score at the end of one half inning. Innings, the Reds, nothing, the Mets coming up. Now, here's a word from Express Mail. Play with the Yankees and other clubs, and he comes in with a record of one and three, an earned run average of 5.33. He's walked 12, struck out 10, given up 31 hits in 27 innings. He's had one shutout so far this year. 
Well, the standard yet very productive Mets lineup against left-handed pitching. Wilson, Tuffle, Hernandez, Strawberry, McGriddle, and Carter, Johnson, Elster, and Gooden. So Rasmussen will be pitching to Mookie Wilson as his first batter. The defense is Saskia, Treadway, Larkin, and Sable. The infield first to third. Daniels, Renneke, and O'Neill in the outfield left to right. The catcher is Diaz. And Mookie Wilson stepping in. Mookie has 11 game hitting streak going. Batting 284. The first pitch foul away. Wilson with two home runs. He has 10 runs batted in. One strike to count. And the big slow curveball, one and one. Rasmussen last year with the Yankees was nine and seven. He also pitched at Columbus, was one and zero, oh, and for the Reds he was four and one. And again the curve, two balls, one strike. Reds lead the league in runs scored with 135, also in walks with 105. And this one is it in foul territory. The Sasky fighting the win and the ball drifts into the stands out of play. I thought that ball was going to be playable, didn't you? The wind really taking it. Mm -hmm. Ball starts out in fair territory. You can see a Sasky looking at the tarp. He thinks he's going to have a play and it keeps drifting, drifting, drifting. Your favorite vocal group, right? The drifters. drifters. <laughs> now the count at two balls and two strikes to Mookie Wilson. And Mookie fouls off a fastball. for the Mets with 14 home runs and 61 RBI. Rasmussen's grandfather played in the major leagues mainly for the Pittsburgh Pirates also had a stint with the Boston Braves. Bill Brubaker. Bill, a very tall third baseman, about six foot four, and of course Dennis, six foot seven. Two and zero the count. This ball of ball, three balls, no strike. More importantly, he struck out only 10. You know, if, a, if a hitter, for example, he strikes out 100 times. That's a good ratio. You'll take that. You don't want a hitter striking out 100 times and walking 25 times. That is true. Here's Keith Hernandez now up to 253. He has four home runs, 20 runs batted in. 
Same thing with a pitcher. You, you don't want that one-to-one. -one. A pitcher walking as many as he strikes out. That's a bad sign. And the curveball, a strike call. Hernandez with 20 RBIs, trailing Bobby Bonilla. the player of the month of April. And of course, as you can see, in the last eight games, Keith has been red hot. 16 runs batted in with a 433 batting average. Ground ball by the first base with a base hit. Tough around second and will go to third. And the Mets will have runners at first and third with one man out. being held at first and because of that Keith gets one of those trickle through base hits 38 hopper through on the right side and the Mets are threatening now the batter will be Daryl Strawberry Daryl hitting 341 eight home runs 15 runs batted in third is Tuffle. He'll score easily. Going back to first is Hernandez. Tuffle scores. Hernandez holds at first. And the Mets lead it one to nothing. I know you feel it too that every time Darrell gets a ball in the air now the crowd thinks it's a home run. He had that ball off the end of the bat, but still deep enough for the sack fly. But the atmosphere of the crowd is very, very interesting with Strawberry hitting the way he's been hitting. And now the batter will be Kevin McReynolds and the throw to first Hernandez back. McReynolds hitting 299, three home runs, 10 runs batted in. Pitch a ball. Reynolds got off to a fast start. The last few ball games, he has really been slumping, but still at the 299 mark. Drive to left field, going way back to left fielder Daniels. It is caught as Daniels takes it off the top of the fence to retire the side. Al Daniels with a spectacular play to end the inning, but the Mets get one run. On one hit, they leave one. The score at the end of one, the Mets won, the Reds nothing. Now here's a word from AT&T. Cal Daniels almost took a home run away from Howard Johnson last Sunday afternoon in Cincinnati. And here takes a home run away from Kevin McReynolds. Uh, and it would have been a two-run homer. So Cal Daniels leaping, great leaping ability, and he's sitting next to a guy with the best leaping ability 
per inch, I guess you'd say, <laughs> in this league. Eric Davis, who took four home runs away from hitters last year. Two from Jack Clark. One from Daryl Starberry. And yeah. Now, it'll be Nick Kosaski to hit against Dwight Gooden here in the top of the second. Saski hitting 267, four home runs, 14 RBIs, and a fastball and ball strike. Masaski against Dwight Gooden is 0 for 6 in his major league career, and he has struck out five of the six times he has faced him. Her ball hits it well to center. Wilson going back, he has plenty of room, and he makes the catch. Interesting, Asaski rounding first and looking out to Mookie Wilson incredulously, and it's almost as though he's saying, if that ball doesn't go out, well, then I can't hit a home run tonight. That wind blowing strongly in from center field. So Gooden picks up his first out here in the second, and he'll be working to Bo Diaz, who has hit Gooden like he owns him. Five for seven against Gooden. Batting 238 for the year, four home runs, nine runs batted in. And the curveball grounded foul. Gooden has never struck out Bo Diaz. And Bo with five hits and seven at bats against him. Mets leading one nothing. One man out. We're in the top of the second inning. Mets able to cash a runner from third on the sacrifice fly. The Reds had the same opportunity in the first and couldn't do it. And a good curveball. Strike two. Gooden's curveball is on tonight. There it is again. It's topped out toward third on throw for a base hit. And now Diaz is six for eight against Dwight Gooden. He can talk about that for the rest of his life. I don't think Howard Johnson saw that ball real well. He gets a late jump. Batting seven and playing center field, number 39. This Ron ball looked Renick. like it's in the position. He got a late jump on that ball. Sometimes the ball will come out of the shirts of the fans in the stands, either a line drive or a ground ball, and you don't get that little extra jump that you would ordinarily get. And it brings up Ron Renicky, who was inserted in the ball game at the last minute. Renicky hitting 400. He's had two hits and five at bats. Renicky was not with the Reds when the Mets played the Reds in Cincinnati last weekend. And the curveball a strike. Keith Hernandez playing behind the runner at first base, a couple of steps off the bag for a little bit of defensive room with the left hand batter up. Fastball for a ball, one ball, one strike. I think Diaz went nine years in professional ball before he had his first stolen base. He signed in 1971, and his first stolen base in professional ball was 1980. He went 11 years without a stolen base, and he has nine in the big leagues, most of them delayed steals. He chases a fastball, one and two. I said 11. Nine was right. 1971 Nine. to 1980. Reds had a, had a stolen base in the first inning, and after a single by Larkin, he made the steal of second, went to third with one man out, and then Gooden struck out Daniels and O'Neill. So the foul ball in the count one and two. Ron gets an A for his perseverance. Been on that elevator from the minors to the big leagues. A little chin music there. The ball gets away from Carter, but 
Diaz stays at first base. Well, it's a tune that most hitters don't like. You can't blame them. Good play by Carter. Alertly getting on that ball and the ball not rolling far enough for Diaz to go to second. That puts a count of two and two. There goes the runner. The ball is taken. The throw down a second in time. And Diaz is thrown out. Gary Carter coming out of the chute and picking up the runner, attempting to steal. First time Gary has nailed the Cincinnati runner. I really don't know where Diaz was going here. Good throw by Carter. And in fairness to Gary, most of the runners that have stolen off of him, there's no way he's going to be able to throw them out. No way. Down three and two, and the pitch back is hit off the hands right at Tuffle. Makes a catch of the little looping line drive. That'll do it. One hit, a man thrown out attempting to steal. No one left on base. The score at the end of one and a half innings. The Mets won, the Reds nothing. Now here's a word from the good old guys. Unstoppable, unbeatable. I know they're going to try to deliver Capone from the train. Where? The Untouchables in Alcatraz Express, Saturday at 8 on Channel 9. We're going out of the bottom of the second inning. You're watching Mets Baseball 88. Leading off on the Mets. WWOR TV, Secaucus, New Gary Jersey. Carter. And coming in for the play by play, a man who stole home. Maybe the last catcher to steal home, Tim McCarthy. I don't know about that. You see Johnny Bench right there? Johnny and I used to have a deal, though, as far as stolen bases are concerned. And we started it earlier in our careers, and he edged me out. I think he had 61, and I had 59. But nobody has edged him out in the home run department, but Gary Carter is coming close and creeping up on him. 274 as a catcher for Carter. Johnny, the number one in hitting home runs as a catcher. And his last one came in dramatic fashion. It was on a day given to Johnny Bench when he went back to catching after playing third. He had a home run on his own special day. 0-1 to Carter, batting 308, 1-0 New York, and the fastball misses one and one to Gary. Johnny Bench, Yogi Berra, Carlton Fisk, and Carter. Home runs by catcher, so Gary is fourth. John has 345. Two and one to Carter. Took something off the fastball. It's two and two to Gary. Hey, what Rasmussen has been traded for some outstanding players. came over from the California Angels for Tommy John. Then in 83, traded to the Yankees, or traded to San Diego for John Montefusco. Breaking ball outside, three and two. And at the end of 1984, he was traded back to the Yankees for Greg Nettles. So Tommy John, John Montefusco, and Greg Nettles. Wait a miss, Carter goes down, strikeout number one for Rasmussen. Rasmussen won away. He also came to the Reds for Bill Gullickson. Yeah. A good pitcher. Eight, now pitching in Japan. 20, the Yankees lost Howard it. Here's Johnson. that last pitch. Carter going for a breaking ball down low. And unhappy for chasing the pitch out of the strike zone. First strikeout for Rasmussen. Howard Johnson, the batter. Ojo batting only 200, but he has been on base. His on base percentage is good. He's third in bases on balls in the National League. And he's had four home runs in his last 11 games. And the curveball is high. What did Joe Gradiola say? That he was traded for a player to be named later more times than anybody? <laughs> Walk around his life <laughs> as what? the player to be named later, right? <laughs> Go 
Moreau was in the trade of mine. I was traded from Pittsburgh to Chicago. He was one of the players in that trade. And the Pirates got their whole mess of people. Preston Ward was a key man in that one. He was a former Dodger player, went to the Cubs. Johnson went too far, one and one to Hojo. Here's the last pitch. Hojo trying to hold up, but he went too far. He got a pretty good stop on the bat, but it went around too far, and first base umpire Dana DeMoose said, yes, strike. One-one pitch fouled away. One and two to Howard Johnson. One-nothing New York. Sacrifice fly by Daryl Strawberry. In the first inning, plated Tim Tuffle. had walked. He went to third on a single by Keith Hernandez. And that's the only scoring so far. This game delayed 50 minutes by rain. Third ball outside. Two and two to Hojo. at first one out the batter Kevin Elston now batting number well, after the breaking balls Johnson gets a fastball and he's Elster. right on top of it literally a line drive in Spanish it's La Lina and that was a La Lina liner any way you want to in any language it was the same major Rogan Kevin Elster feeling more at home every day at shortstop and at the plate. Takes ball one. They look for the hit and run here. Sam Palazzo flashing the signs. There goes Johnson. Fastball is a strike. The throw not in time. Howard got a late break on this one and still manages to steal the base. His four stolen base in five attempts. Last year he had 32 and he got a bad jump, but he still makes it the throw. Look at that late start. Ball's in the dirt down to second as the shortstop Larkin has to come up with it. Going away from the sliding runner. One and one to Kevin Elster. Johnson at second with one out. One to nothing, New York. Swings and misses. One and two. I was a teammate of Pete Rose's in 1979, and when I first went into broadcasting my first year, I was feeling my way around. And Pete wanted to help me out with the signs. He said, I'll give you the steel sign. I said, fine. Got it. Larry Boa missed it four times in a row. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling everybody, well, he's certainly going now. Boa missed it four times in a row. And I told Pete after that fourth time, I said, I don't want it anymore. <laughs> I thought he was intentionally giving me the wrong sign. Two and two to Elster. We had that happen to us, but I was playing for Pittsburgh. Turkey Nick Hall was the third baseman then. Later on, became an outstanding pitcher. He was on first base. We were playing in Ebbets Field, and Billy Meyer, our manager, gave him a steal sign. He didn't go. Three and two to Elston. Campanella pitched out. He didn't run. He gave it to him again, and again Campanella pitched out. They had our signs. It wasn't very complicated. <laughs> he didn't go again. Finally, he never did go. Finally, they came, got it, got the inning over, and he came into the dugout. Billy Meyer said, did, "Why didn't you go?" He said, "Didn't you get the sign?" He said, "Yeah, I got it. So why didn't you go?" He said, "I didn't think you meant it." <laughs> Sounds like from that story that they had the signs more than you we did. We didn't, yeah. <laughs> That's a double agent, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> when the other team can get the signs, but you can't. Three-two pitch. Foul 
ball that cued into the or near the dugout. I think that's Karen Jackson, our right field ball gal. Karen and Sharon. Sharon down the left field line. Karen down the right field line. Three and two to Elster. There's Sharon. Sharon the duties with Karen. Uh-huh. Very good. Strike on the inside corner. Second strikeout for Rasmussen. Rasmussen and Dwight Gooden the better. Well, he throws the fastball right on through and Elster taking the pitch for the strikeout. And that'll bring up Dwight Gooden with a runner in scoring position. And with men in scoring position, Dwight Gooden is three for seven with four runs batted in this year. Curveball fouled away, 0 and 1 to Dwight. Pretty good respect when they start him off with the curveball. It has started to rain again here at Shea. May be able to see that in your picture. Game delayed 50 minutes by rain. And as we said, the Mets, the worst thing that could happen tonight, as far as their team's standpoint is concerned, is to have Dwight Good go two or three innings and then have the game rained out. One and two. That happened to the Mets with Dwight Gooden in Atlanta in a game that finally ended at 3.55 the next day. 3.55 in the morning. Yeah, they lost good, but they finished the game. <laughs> they finished the game. I guess you could say that. <laughs> July 4th and 5th of 85. They say history repeats itself. <laughs> well, Dennis Rasmussen, I don't know if he's ever done it before, but he strikes out the side. Stranding Johnson in second. It's one to nothing New York after two, and we're back after this from Bobo. of Cincinnati here in the top of the third with the Mets leading one to nothing. Jeff betting 243. Seven doubles to his credit. A couple of stolen bases. Outside fastball. Ball one. Jeff broke in with a bang last year. He played 21 games with Cincinnati batting 333 and he hit in 17 of those 21. Fly ball center field and shallow. Wilson makes the catch, one away, and the batter, Dennis Rasmussen. Goodness struck out two, is walked no one. Two base hits of a similar kind in the left Rasmussen. field. Two ground balls from two right-handed hitters. Both counts, one and two, as a matter of fact. Dennis, one for ten on the year. Met outfield shallow and around toward left. And a liner up the middle by Wilson in center. Rasmussen's going to have a double, and the Mets are fortunate that the outfield grass is wet. Otherwise, he's on the third base. How about that? This is only his second hit, 11 at bats, and I want to say he really hit a line drive. This ball is by Mookie before he can really take more than a few steps. Look at this. As Tim pointed out, the grass is slow, very wet. The ball doesn't roll to the fence. Otherwise, he would have surely had a triple. So Rasmussen back sure to the National League again. You see once again how that low fastball is a lot easier to handle off good than that cheese upstairs. Reds now with three hits. They trail one to nothing. One of those hits obtained by Barry Larkin in the first. Barry stole second. He was moved to third on a Chris Sabo ground out. But then Gooden struck out Daniels and Paul O'Neill to end the inning without a run being scored. one nothing New York. Her ball is low. Ball one. Strawberry definitely too deep in right field. Respect Larkin's power to left field, but you can see Darrell way too deep. When a right-handed hitter hits the ball the other way, usually he's hitting with his arms. Try to position yourself to where he can't hit the line drive over your head. Maybe a fly ball, but on a fly ball, you can get back and feel. 
field. Tied ball two, two and out. Also, we've discovered earlier in the ball game on two balls hit very well. The ball was not carrying to the outfield. Right. Cal Daniels took a home run away from Kevin McReynolds, the ball that would normally have been a home run by a pretty good distance. And Nick Asaski of the Reds to lead off the second inning. Drill one deep to center, but Mookie was there. The ball not carrying well. One out, one on. 2-0 to Barry Larkin. quarter the Boston Celtics 35 the Knicks are 28. Gooden, his first on a curveball tonight against Cincinnati. His last time out, he struck out six batters, all on curveballs. So the K corner going again here at Jay. It's one to nothing, New York. Chris Sabo grounded out his first at bat. Chris with 14 extra base hits. Grounder towards second. Tim Tuffle. Over to Hernandez. So once again, Gooden pitches out of trouble. The Red Strand, the runner, is still 1 0. Mets, middle of the third. And we're back after this for Manufacturers Hanover. Well, Mets fans, here's your chance to make this year's Memorial Day weekend even more memorable. Sunday, May 29th, is starter head and wristband day. All fans 14 and under who attend the Mets Padre game that afternoon will receive a Mets headband and a pair of wristbands courtesy of Starter. Start your summer off right with the Starter headband and wristband and the New York Mets. All Mets tickets are available. For ticket information, call 718-507-TIXX during business hours. Ralph, I will echo that because 1988 promises to be the most exciting, exciting season so far. So please make your plans now in order to get the best seats available. Tickets for all Mets home games are now on sale at all Ticketron outlets. Shea Stadium's advanced ticket window, or you can call Teletron at 212-747-5850 by mail, or call 718-507-TIXX. So that's Teletron, you can order by mail, or you can call 718-507-TIXX during regular business hours for more information. Let's go for it again. That's a rallying cry here at Shea. And the Mets are obviously paying attention to their own rally cry. They're going for it. Mets are game and a half up on the Pittsburgh Pirates in the first place. Mookie Wilson leads it off here in the bottom of the third. One nothing ball game. Darrell Strawberry sacrifice fly in the first. The only scoring so far. Fouled away. 
0-1 to Mookie. He popped to second his first to bat. Mets pitchers just stringing zeros across the board, huh? 23 consecutive innings without allowing a run. And counting. Outside, ball one. You mentioned the streak earlier in the year, 30 consecutive scoreless innings. The Met record set back in 1969, that's no surprise, <laughs> 42 scoreless innings in a row. And guess who did it? Right field is an out. One out, the batter tip tough. Tom Seaver. the complete game record right right good has got four to do that he's had four in a row but as far as the shutout inning 42 consecutive uh-huh double the only run that scored in this game he walked went to third on a single by hernandez and then came in on the sacrifice fly by daryl strawberry one and out of two ball two tim has yet to see a strike he walked on four pitches his first time up ground ball base hit up the middle So Tim Temple continues to come around. He's down nine for his last 25. He gets a fastball and his first strike and his first hit. So Temple at first base with one out in the batter, Keith Hernandez. Mets now with three hits. Cincinnati has three hits. This game delayed 50 minutes. If you think your clock is running too fast. <laughs> Speaking of clocks running out, Boston Bruins three, the New Jersey Devils nothing in the second period. That's at the Meadowlands. Across the way, our New Jersey neighbors, 1-0 to Keith Hernandez. Devils have gone farther than anyone has ever expected anyway. Everything else is just gravy. What a remarkable year for the New Jersey Devils. 1-0 to Hernandez. year was the Cardinals. And their world championship came in 1986, so it does take time, but it's nice to see a group of young players. They don't believe anybody saying that they're too young. They just go out and win. What a wonder Hernandez. So far, the Pittsburgh Pirates are doing that. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. 27 of their last 38 to end the year last year. Outside of Hernandez, two balls in the strike to keep. They won 17 and lost only six of their first 23 games this year. Then ran to the Dodgers and lost three straight in L.A. The Dodgers leading the Cardinals tonight behind Fernando Valenzuela at St. Louis. One nothing ball game. Two balls and a strike to Hernandez. The hit and run may be on here. See a tougher run. Red 
certainly looking for the hit and run play here. Tuffle's not a base dealer. He had only three last year. But Keith Hernandez, a fine hit and run man. Not running the fastball outside. Three balls in the strike. And Davey likes to use the hit and run on a 3 1 count, which is somewhat unusual. 3 1 count considered to be a hitter's count, and you let that hitter pick his spot and hit away. I agree. You don't want the distraction of a runner in that situation. There are a lot of managers who use that, however. There goes Tuffle. And it's popped up right side. Sabo back. Make that tread way. And he makes the play. So the second out of the inning recorded. And the batter, Daryl Strawberry. one of those situations that everybody is not going to agree with. The reason I agree with you is I think the distraction of the runner takes something away from the hitter in that situation. Even though Keith is a very experienced hitter in that yeah. spot, with the runner going, you have in the back of your mind to protect him. And you might go for a bad pitch. Swing and a miss, 0 and 1. Or you might go for a strike that's not your strike. Right. It might be a high strike in that particular instance. Hernandez is not a high ball hitter, especially against left-handed pitching. So he may have gone for a high strike that he normally wouldn't have swung at in a 3-1 situation. Takes the bat away from the, the hitter to some, some degree. To some, yeah. yeah. Tommy Helms in his fifth ball game, sitting next to Scott Breeden, the pitching coach for Cincinnati. Pete Rose appealed today in front of the executive committee, and there's your Celtic score. Executive committee turned down the appeal. And Bart Giamatti's suspension stands. This one lifted to center. Back broke Renicky and now in, and he makes the play. No runs, a hit, and one left. It's one to nothing New York after three, and we're back after this for Budweiser. A high-rise fire in lower Manhattan raises the question, could L.A.'s towering inferno happen here? And Jersey City's police department gets some rough criticism. Details after the game. Dwight Gooden warming up here in the top of the fourth inning and warming up for his color commentary, Rusty Staub. Well, welcome back. Nice to see you again. You've been gone nice a long time. Well, you guys were the guys that were gone. <laughs> or is that the way it was? <laughs> no, it's good to be back, Ralph, in the booth. It's always a pleasure to get a chance to watch a major league game, talk about it. Here's something you used to work at. I remember when you used to come up to in the Astrodome with a... With a uh, spikes on one foot and the and the rubber spikes on the other and you'd hit that way and then get down the first and have to change shoes they have a shoe first pitch by Dwight Gooden lined in the left field for a base hit by Cal Daniels who had struck out his first time up with a runner on third Cal Daniels jumping on that first fastball with Dwight Gooden and it's right out over the plate right where he likes it that line drive right back through the box in reference to what you were talking about, Ralph, there was a lot of clay in that Dome Stadium batter's box. And I had pulled my hamstring rounding third base in those days. They had mud on the infield. It wasn't like they had just the little islands of bases where you had mud around the bases. The whole infield was mud. And then when you get to the third base, it was so hard. This was the original AstroTurf that I tore hamstring three times rounding third base. So I decided, <laughs> even with as slow as I was then, that there might be a reason for that. And so I stopped wearing my, I just used the spike to kick in the hole in the, my back foot at home plate. And then when I got on the bases, I changed and used the soccer shoes, and it worked. No more pulled hamstring. I didn't pull another hamstring as long as I did that, but the league changed that. Joe Morgan decided at one point he was having trouble with uh, one of his uh, ankles, I believe, and he tried to do that later on, I think when he was with the Philadelphia Phillies and the league passed a rule that you could not change your shoes. I think that rule still exists. Daniels over at first base drawing some attention. 
He has seven stolen bases and nine attempts, and the Reds have had one stolen base already in this ballgame. Well, there's absolutely no doubt that they came into Shea Stadium with quite good pitch and realizing that if they got people on base, they were going to have to be aggressive. Gooden does not move the first base poorly, but his move to home plate takes a long time. Gary Carter's been throwing better than he has in a long time, but the length of time for Gooden to get that ball to the plate is just, you know, maybe a step too long, and the Reds are trying to take advantage of it. Certainly, if you're going to get to Dwight Gooden and you get on base, you got to put as much pressure on each time as you can, I think. Well, you don't get that many opportunities, and when you have one, you have to take advantage of it. Bruins four, Devils nothing in the second period. Paul O'Neill, the batter. Paul also struck out his first time up. Again, over to first. When Gooden first came to the major leagues, he had a very poor move to first. That was understandable because he never had anybody on base. <laughs> he was striking out about 350 a year. Developed a good move to first, as Rusty pointed out, but power pitchers and delivering home take a little more time. A good example would be Nolan Ryan, who takes a lot of time throwing home. You don't need much when you're a base runner of the day. hitting in the cleanup position when Eric Davis was scratched the last minute because of a stiff neck. Quite good pitching on the night that he likes to pitch the most on. 14 and 4. Friday nights. Ground ball in the hole of base hit. Going to third is Daniels. No play there as Strawberry tosses it back in. And runners at first and third with no one out. The Mets leading by a score of 1-0. And again, the Reds threaten. Oh, he gets that curveball. It's out over the plate this time. He's a little bit out front, but he gets enough on the ball to hit it right in between the hole between first and second base. Certainly Tuffle was shading toward second base, looking for the double play. Runners at first and third, no one out, and Nick Kosaski the bat. Fifth base hit given up by Gooden. We're in the top of the fourth inning. Kosaski flat out to deep center his first time up. And he has struggled his whole career against the New York Mets. He's hit great in Atlanta. That's the one place he just hits about 450 every year at. But against the Mets, he's a lifetime 183 hitter. Gooden's fastball is strike. Against Gooden, he is 0 for 7 and has struck out five of the seven times. He made good contact his first time up tonight. Ball was hit very well, center field. Mets have their infield a double play depth. And again, getting the fastball. So Gooden with two fastballs out in front with a two strike count. Fastball up and in, he swings and misses. He catches the outside corner of another fastball. When you're a hitter now, you know he's getting the curveball over the ball. You're in trouble. You don't know what to look for. A little defensive right here, doesn't it? You better. Choke up a little bit. Inside out, try to get that run in. Fastball hit down to Keith. He holds the runner at third and picks up the play at first. And on the play, O'Neill goes down to second. So the Mets playing a little bit like they were in the ninth inning of this ball game with a threat of rain. They did not want that runner to score from third, and Keith picked up the ad at first. This game is brought to you in part by your Lincoln Catcher. Mercury oh, dealers yeah. and by Tropicana. Certainly the, certainly the rain is a factor right now. I think Keith Hernandez with Nick Asaski running could have got a double play on that ball, but he would have given up the run. certainly had to be a thought in Keith's mind because he did have a shot at two. If he had gone for the double play, the run would have scored. Daniels was down the line a bit. Now the batter is Bo Diaz, who has hit good and better than anybody. 
six for eight against Dwight Gooden in his major league career. And as opposed to a Sasky before him, he has really hit the Mets very well his whole career in the National League, obviously, with Philadelphia and here in Cincinnati. 326 lifetime hitter against the New York Mets. Ralph Bettman fall back close here. Fouled back close to you. I didn't bail as much as I normally did. I hit it all the way. I thought maybe you might. <laughs> he did lean a little. It is just about right down there. <laughs> I'll never forget Bo Diaz. He probably hit one of the toughest home runs against him. That's that grand slam home run he hit. In the bottom of the ninth inning. Off Neil Allen. Boy, that was a, a just a heart crusher. Early in the year, but it really destroyed the Mets. For some reason, there was a metal block from then on. That's when Denton Hill that year, from that moment on. Fastball and fouled off to the right side. Gooden had a good fastball there and got it in on him in a good spot. Gooden had a runner at third with one man out in the first inning, struck out Daniels and O'Neill. Now the runners at first and third with no one out. He has picked up an out. And the runners are now at second and third with one out. The Mets are playing deep in the infield. They are conceding a run on a ground out. They have to play back to keep that go-ahead run at second base from scoring with the infield in. And a swing and a miss. And Gooden strikes out Bo Diaz for the first time and aided bats. That could be a big one. The great pitchers always have a way to reach back and find something when they need it. You're going to see it right here. A fastball that is a strike. That's not a ball. It's a strike pitch. He throws it so hard it goes by Bo Diaz. And he gets the strikeout with men on second and third. One out. They do not take advantage of that second and third situation. Now with two men out, the batter will be Ron Renneke. Renneke popped up to the second baseman his first time up, but he takes a fastball strike one. Renneke just called up from Nashville in his first game. He went two hits in the game with three runs batted in. Curveball. Right. I'll tell you, the guy that was the happiest guy in the ballpark that quite good and stuck struck out uh, Bo Diaz, and that's Keith Hernandez because he made the decision. There you see another great curveball by Dwight Good. Hernandez made that decision, and it worked out right so far. Two-strike pitch, and it's bounced out to second. Temple has it. They pick up the out, and Gooden gets out of the jam. Runners at first and third with nobody out, and they do not score. Two men left in scoring position. The score at the end of three and a half innings. The Mets won, the Reds nothing. Now here's a word from your Lincoln Mercury dealer. Well, we're going now to the bottom half of the fourth inning. The Mets leading by a score of one nothing, and Kevin McReynolds will be the leadoff batter for the Mets. Kevin robbed of a home run on a great play by Daniels his first time up. He hit that ball with a man on base. And Rasmussen with a curveball strike one. You see that five for 32. He's been struggling. Fast ball and it's one ball and one strike. And it's only when you're struggling that they make those great plays off. You. That was really an outstanding play by Cal Daniels. That ball would have been a home run. Fastball again and the count two and one. Mets have one run on three hits. The Reds have no runs on five. The Reds have had a hit in every inning against Dwight Gooden. And they have left a runner at third with no one out and a runner at third with one man out twice. And a high pop-up into right field. O'Neill makes the catch one away. And he's on National League scoreboard. Philadelphia over the last seven to three. That's your over San Francisco three to two. All tied up in the tenth. San Diego at Pittsburgh. In Montreal, Houston's behind four to three, bottom of the seventh, and at the top of the fifth, Los Angeles four, St. Louis one. And the batter for the Mets.
out, so big Gary Carter. Carter struck out swinging at a curveball his first time up. Batting 308 with seven home runs, 15 runs batted in for the season. And the slow curve for ball one. Gary Carter coming up on that 300th home run. Look to ask Ralph how he felt when he was coming up on that. If he put pressure on himself, just count him. That's all. Don't put pressure. On him. I agree. It's just a little difficult sometimes, though, when you're getting to one of those marks to not give a little extra effort to try to get there. You normally get in trouble if you do, though. This ball hit the center field. Reneke, the center fielder. Two men away. Let's go to the Eastern American League scoreboard. Chicago at Baltimore was postponed. Minnesota had a loss to 2 0 in the fifth. Johnson. Kansas City, Milwaukee all tied up in the fourth. Also in the fourth, Texas one run over the Yankees. Detroit at Seattle, Cleveland at Oakland, and Toronto at California are all later tonight. Howard Johnson, the batter. Howard with a single his first time up. Later on, had a stolen base. Johnson now hitting 209 for the year. Rasmussen starts him off for ball one. Johnson has had four home runs in his last 11 games and has a total of five for the year. Had 36 home runs last season. Two balls, no strikes. talking about pressure and what have you I tried I think I, you and I both had about the same thought about hitting I tried to make it as precision like as I could every time I went up not do anything different ball hit foul back out of play in other words just be as mechanical as you could be same type swing same type swing over and over again well I'll tell you you know certain pitchers you, you, know, you approach it a little differently at least I did you know, if it was a tough left-hander, I might not try to pull him, but it, it's the same idea of going there mechanically the same way. I, I always felt like the more you could be like a machine and, and have a, something in your mind and execute it, uh, if you stayed with your thought, that was the way to go. The guys that get in between or that don't have a, a real set way to go about it, you know, you're up there just hoping. And the fastball that calls strike, two and two. Some people with great talent can get away with that. I personally felt like I had to work at it different. Get a look here at Rasmussen here. Fastball catching that inside corner. Ball kind of hit a little hop on it. Sets that fastball up with that slow curveball. Johnson single off a fastball his first time up. Gets around in this fastball, pulls it way foul. get a big tall pitcher like Rasmussen out there you just really like it's the first time you face someone like him it's got to be a little difficult because he's so tall you just really expect him to blow the ball and he's more of a finesse pitcher good change up good breaking ball those pitches set up the fastballs he uses to second and holding there. And with two men out, Sammy Palazzo, the third base coach, holds him up, and rightfully so. Now batting, shortstop, Kevin Elker. Well, Johnson really puts the wood on this one. It's a double all the way. That ball exploded when it got about a third of the way out there. Short hop the wall. See O'Neal picking that up. with a runner at second and two men out and Kevin Elster the batter. Kevin caught looking at a fastball his first time up. Tommy Helms, the manager of the Cincinnati Reds and he'll manage throughout the rest of this month. They're going to walk Elster to get to the pitcher to White Gooden. Gooden has been tough with men in scoring position. He's three for eight with four runs batted in. So he'll have a shot at an RBI when he comes up after the walk to Elston. Second walk given up by Rasmussen. The first was to Tim 
Tuffle, and Tuffle scored the only run of the ball game after that walk on a sacrifice fly by Daryl Strawberry. Deep in the outfield, especially in right field, O'Neill. And the breaking ball for ball one. Gooden has had four hits this year. The only outfielder that's even challenging Gooden whatsoever is in center field. That's Ron Renneke. Down to Daniels and O'Neill are both playing too deep here. And it's moved into the second base area and caught by the second baseman Fredway and that'll end the inning so a hit and a walk and two left to score at the end of four the Mets won the Reds nothing now here's a word from Nissan you may not always recognize his face but you definitely know his name my name is Billy Green your name is Beretta Beretta Saturday at 1 on Channel 9 Dwight Gooden getting set for the top of the fifth. Mets leading by a score of 1-0. His first batter will be Jeff Treadway. Jeff starting the ball game hitting 243 with no home runs. Six runs batted in. Flat out to center field his first time up. Reds about hit the Mets 5-4. And Gooden's curveball taken for ball one. Johnson playing in close at third. Second period, the Bruins five, the Devils one. Fastball for ball two. Hit well in the minor leagues. Alternates at second base with Dave Concepcion and the fastball for a strike two and one. Game delayed about 50 minutes because of the rain and now underway we're in the top of the fifth. That's leading one nothing on a run scored back in the first. One of the finest hitters, clutch hitters, for about 15 years, maybe longer than that. Tony Perez, 23 years in the major leagues. That's a good number. <laughs> you know something about that, don't you? <laughs> Three and two the count. ball hit out to left field the wind blowing the ball away from McReynolds but he gets over there and foul territory and he makes the play good hustling by McReynolds on this ball doesn't give up on it ball appeared to be like when it was hit that it was going to go foul into the seats but that wind is gusting all over the place in shade you can Fisher, never trust it you have to go for the ball and he certainly did on that play so the odd brings up Dennis Rasmussen, who lined the double by Mookie Wilson in center field his first time up. He really got all of it. Fastball, the ball. Gooden has struck out four. He has not walked a batter. Ball for ball two, two balls, no strike. Kind of shows you how Mike Gooden feels about that curveball tonight. The pitcher's up, he's behind him, one ball and no strikes, and he throws a curve. And the fastball was strike, two and one. Dave Concepcion. Eric Davis with that stiff neck. You see it all wrapped up there. Ball, two balls, two strikes. Day game tomorrow. Got to be warmer than tonight. Supposed to be. Strike three. Got him with a fastball. Gooden picks up his fifth strikeout. Just 
the old rare back and throw a good strike. It's not a real Short tough location. Down, pretty good pitch to swing at. Just exploded too quick for the pitcher. So two men away and Barry Larkin the batter. Larkin has singled and struck out in his two appearances. Larkin four for 12 against Dwight Gooden in his major league career. Just done one heck of a job for the Reds so far this year. Getting on base. 25 out of 27 games. That's ball one. He leads the National League in multiple hit games with a total of 12. Third ball and ball two. Two balls, no strikes. Three inning as he gives up a base hit his sixth there in the fifth inning. Third baseman Chris Sabo. Again, just going with the pitch. It's a fastball away. He goes right back through the box. Good to pick the better spot to hit it in. And he is a threat to steal. Had a stolen base back in the first inning. Now has 11 stolen bases in 14 attempts. Sabo is 0 for 2 against Good. Twice has grounded out. You can see that rain drizzling behind Sable's head there. And the first pitch to fastball. It's not a hard rain. Just a constant drizzle. Mets leading one nothing. Two men out. Top of the fifth inning. Short lead that time, two round, very short. The Reds are one for one, make that one for two in stolen bases. The Bo Diaz one had to be a hit and run that got <laughs> messed up by somebody though, because he's certainly not trying to steal that many bases. Nine years without a stolen base. Ground ball out to the hole at shortstop. Elster has no play and loses the ball as he tries to make the pivot and the throw. That'll be a base hit. His only chance on that one was to be able to make a quick play towards second base. Sabo got out of the box extremely well. This is a tough play, obviously, for any shortstop. This is definitely a base hit. Left fielder Cal Daniel. Sabo's got good speed. And Johnson moving just over his head. Just couldn't get the grip. Seventh hit off Gooden. Runners now at first and second with two men out, and Cal Daniels is the batter. Daniels with a single and two at bats also has struck out. Got called out on strikes back in the first inning with one man out and a runner at third. This is Daniels' third shot at the run batted in. And a fly ball hit out the deep right center. Mookie Wilson back to the warning track and he makes the catch. And once again, Gooden escapes without a run. Two hits and two men left to score at the end of about four and a half innings. The Mets won, the Reds nothing. Now here's a word from the good old guys. Do you know how much this car costs? 16 million. Tonight at 11 on Channel 9. Mets clean him one nothing. Don now Good working on the shutout. You're watching Mets baseball 88 on WWOR TV, Secaucus, New Jersey. Well, Lenny Dykstra sitting it out as the left-hander works in the mound for the Cincinnati Reds, and Mookie Wilson will lead it off. Mookie playing in center field. Dennis Rasmussen on the mound and the curveball taken for ball one. Mookie 0 for two tonight. Brought 11 game hitting streak into this game. And in 275, he has the longest current hitting streak in the National League. Two balls, no strike. Extra hitting 339. 
three home runs, eight runs batted in. And this ball popped up. He is looking for help. As Saskia says, I'll try it and run away. From the time that ball was hit, both Diaz was definitely looking for help. <laughs> that ball, this is a very windy night. You see his hands coming been. over to get yeah. this ball down. Oh. But I'm no telling part you, of it, did he? he took that mask off and started pointing at third and first. <laughs> he didn't want anything to do with that pop-up. Now the batter will be Tim Tuffle. Tuffle has walked and scored, scored the only run of the game. That was back in the first inning. He also has single. That's with four hits, but leading one nothing. The Reds have seven. Breaking ball a strike. This is Rasmussen's third try for his second win. drop in the count one ball one strike this is the beginning of a nine game road trip for the Cincinnati Reds it's kind of unusual because the Mets are leaving on Sunday they're going on a two week road trip Usually when the east and the west they, they kind of travel together ground ball to third Sabo with it throws it high but in time for Isaski to go up in the air and get down before Tuffle could get to the bat. Sabo's playing very deep on this ball. On throw. First baseman, Keith Hernandez. High, and that foot does come down. Sasky gets that foot on the bag first. Good call by Dana DeMuth. So two men away as Sabo gets the assist, and Keith Hernandez comes to the plate. Keith with a base hit and two times up. His single to right field in the first inning, set up a run for the Mets. Tuffle going from first to third in the base and scoring on the sacrifice fly by Darryl Strawberry. That was not a knockdown pitch, it was a curveball. A big old high curveball that gets away from him a little bit. It is wet out. The constant drizzle, as we've told you. Sometimes you get a little wet finger. The ball gets a little wet too. With that slider in the cam, one and one. Mets on that road trip will go to Houston, then to San Francisco, then to San Diego, and then to Los Angeles. Check swing foul ball. He's way out in front of that slow curve. Stab will be making that trip to Houston back to his hometown. Yes, well, my hometown is New Orleans, Louisiana, but Houston has been my residence now for about 26 years. Again, the curveball, two and two, no swing. Dutch Renner said he did not go far enough. So the count remains two balls and two strikes. Maybe we can find some sun down there, Ralph. Some heat. It's been tough to find. I talked to my daughter down there. She said it's been perfect. 80 degrees. Just don't mess it up. Yeah. <laughs> A cool, wet spring in New York City this year. Two balls and two strikes. That's had one good day in St. Louis. One pretty good day in Cincinnati. That's been about it. It's an official ball game now. Bottom of the fifth, the men's hit one nothing. amazing to see as many people in the stands as there is tonight Ralph. steady rain and most of the people thought it would never be played two and two and the curve for ball three full count to Keith Hernandez this is 
sort of like Seattle weather. Never really rain hard, but just steady. They do have that one advantage, though. Doesn't matter when they play. <laughs> they have a dome. And Keith lays off again. It's confirmed by third base umpire Dutch Leonard. Keith has a walk. And the Mets have a runner on with two men out. Dutch Rennett given the call at third base. Get a look at it right here. Another off-speed pitch. Hernandez just checks that swing. Tough call for the umpire. Certainly a good, quick call by Dutch Rennett. And with the walk to Keith Hernandez, the batter will be Daryl Strawberry, who has driven in the only run of the game. A sacrifice fly to center field. He also has flied out to center. So he's 0 for 1 officially. Sasky playing off the bag at first and the curveball for ball one. Darrell second in home runs in the National League. Andre Dawson leads with nine. Darrell has eight. Also with eight is Bobby Bonilla. As you look at Tommy Helms, the manager of the Reds for the month of May. Ball two. Two balls, no strikes. Next to him was Scott Green, the pitching coach. Obviously, the next to each other. I think they're going to get a little action as you see Breeden on the phone there calling down to that bullpen. They're not happy with the Boston right now. There goes the runner and Hernandez not being held on. Steals the base and he did not have a stolen base last year. That is his first this year. Well they ought to give him the base or something here Ralph. They got to do something. Big slow curveball. Nobody paid attention to him. Smart base running by Keith Hernandez. Oh, Diaz making an effort, but certainly Hernandez had an incredible jump. Sasky was playing way behind him at first. Pitcher didn't pay any attention whatsoever to it. So he stole the base. So they got two and one, and they talk it over at the mound. Better be talking about that in the clubhouse tonight, Ralph. <laughs> in 86, Keith had two stolen bases. He had none in 87. And now one here in 88. Strawberry with a runner in scoring position. And it's up the middle of base hit. Hernandez will score, and the Mets will lead it 2 to nothing as Keith picks up a stolen base to get in the scoring position. A lot of things are going right. Keith Hernandez gets a stolen base. Darryl Strawberry singles up the, up the middle. And the Mets score another run. Strawberry has driven in both runs now. And that'll bring up Kevin McReynolds, who has no hits and two times up, but robbed of a home run and a great play by Daniels as he took a ball that was over the left field fence and took a base hit away from McDaniel. I, mean, I should say from McReynolds. Strawberry also is a threat to steal. The throw to first. Darrell with five stolen bases in eight attempts this year. Last year he had 36 stolen bases. Him picked off at first. The Sasky hesitates, no one covering, and Strawberry will get a stolen base. The Sasky had to hold up as Larkin was not covering in time. That's a tough play because of McReynolds at the plate. Larkin is playing in the hole, trying to think that McReynolds is going to pull the ball. So the shortstop would have been covering on a normal play. On a pickoff, it backfired on him. Very difficult for Larkin to get all the way from where he's playing McReynolds to second base, which was obvious. And the curveball for a ball. One ball, no strikes. I don't think you can blame Larkin for that, Ralph. He's playing way in the hole. 
Maybe the second the baseman should have been covering. And was not alert enough to take that play as he should have. Well, he's got to pay attention to that pitcher, especially if Larkin's going to play where he is. As Frank Williams warming up at the bullpen. Tough play, no matter how you how you want to call that one. the count to Kevin McReynolds. I have no earthly idea what Kevin McReynolds was looking for there, Ralph. That was right down the heart of the plate. Fastball right in the slot. that he was looking breaking ball two balls in the strike thinking that they were going to try to pitch around him with that open base so it's two and two on the foul ball and the curveball hit on the ground to Larkin go to first base will retire the side but the Mets get a run on some fine base running by Keith Hernandez they leave one on a walk and two hits and the score at the end of five as Steve Sabrisky comes in to join Rusty Stop. It's a Mets two and the Reds nothing. Now here's a word from Drexel Burnham. As you look at Keith Hernandez and the Mets ahead two to nothing going into the top of the sixth inning. We'll bring in Steve Sabrisky for the play-by-play. -play. Thanks a lot, Russ, and a good evening to you all. Paul O'Neill will lead it off against the doctor here in the sixth inning. And the Mets leading two to nothing because of that stolen base by Hernandez. Two-out single to center by Strawberry, who's driven in both runs. O'Neill one for two. That's a little score for you. Celtics 71, 70 over the Knicks. Bunt for a base hit. Good and bare hands. Throws not in time. Hit number eight for the Cincinnati Reds. And really only two of them were well-hit balls. Excellent bunt by O'Neill trying to get something going for his team. Even though they put him in the four slot, his job as the leadoff man is to get on base, and he makes a, a really good bunt. Gooden made a fine play on that to make it a close play at first. He barehanded that ball and threw a good throw to Hernandez, but O'Neill with good speed beat, the, uh, speed beat the ball out anyway. So the now the Reds are able to bring the tying run to the plate. And we are in the sixth inning. This is now an official game, and the rain is falling a little bit harder here as Nick Asaski bats. Nick 0 for 2 and 0 for 8 against Dwight Gooden. Fastball lofted into right center field and deep. Strawberry at the track makes the catch. And O'Neill, who was halfway, will go back to first with one out. That's the second ball. The Sasky has hit tonight, Rusty, that I think on a rainless, warmer evening had a chance of being out of here. Well, he certainly, uh, the first time and the third time up, hit the ball well. Catcher Bo Diaz. His last time up with men on second and third and nobody out. You see Strawberry a little bit. Drifting back on that ball. That's all he needed that second time up to drive in a run. But Gooden was able to really muster up something and throw that fast ball by him. Now here's Bo Diaz, who has hit the doctor quite well as O'Neill draws somewhat of a token throw. Again, when you struggle against a certain pitcher, or if you're struggling in general, but certainly against a certain pitcher, it seems that things like that happen. He hit two balls about 400 feet, and all they needed was one of them to get a, get a run in, and he didn't, he didn't make any contact the one time he needed to. Diaz has not struggled against Gooden, and he... Swings right over the top of the good breaking ball for strike one. Doc has struck out five through the first five and the third innings tonight. He has not walked the bat. High fastball right up in his face, and Diaz with a weak swing for strike two. This is fastball out of the zone. It explodes up top. 
Diaz might have had an idea right there that, that that location of the ball might have been that curveball breaking ball he started the trigger and it just it was an explosive fastball that was up and in no chance whatsoever 0 and 2 fastball grounded to third Johnson gets the one at second and on first in time a ball that really wasn't hit sharply enough to think of as a double play ball turned into a double play by the Mets to end the inning two to nothing New York in the middle of the sixth and we're back after this for the New York Times. Friday May 13th it's Jason versus Tina Don't go in there! the match made in hell Jason is back, but someone is waiting. Get off on that porch. There goes the neighborhood. Friday the 13th, part 7, The New Blood, rated R. Starts Friday, May 13th at a theater near you. Between innings, the crowd cheering here at Shea as the score between the Knicks and the Celtics was posted in the fourth quarter. The Knicks have tied it up. 77 all in their NBA playoff game after trailing the Celtics. Gary Carter leads off the bottom half of the sixth inning for the Mets. They lead the Reds two to nothing. Carter tonight is struck out, swinging and fly to center. That slow breaking ball of Rasmussen stays outside. Ball one. Gary's been in a little bit of a mini slump lately, even though he's driven in 11 runs in the last 15 games. His average. And has dropped about 30 points in the last week. Ball two outside. 0 for 12 seem to do that to you. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when you don't have that many ABs in the beginning of the season. Well, I was talking to Ralph earlier about him gaining on that 300th home run. He's only two away. Whether he's trying a little too hard now to hit that ball out of the ballpark. Well, we talked about it earlier in the season how Gary had adjusted and was going with the pitch and going more up the middle. Not flying open as much and trying to pull everything. And maybe he has gotten out of that groove. Drives this one the other way. It's going to be foul, however, down the right field line. Well, his last time up, he went right back through the middle towards center field. It wasn't the ball that he really pulled off of. Certainly went well toward right field with that. Front shoulder staying right in there, getting on top of the ball. Good swing. So it's two and two to Gary. Carter to be followed by Howard Johnson and Kevin Elster. Front shoulder is a key for almost every hitter. You've got to keep it in there. Good curveball for strike three, and Carter knew it. He was locked up. And Rasmussen picks up his fourth strikeout. One out here in the sixth inning. Mixing it up very well. Rasmussen, good curveball. Of course, I don't know if you could throw it in a better spot. A perfect pitch. That is a big breaking curveball. You can never quit on it. Good night for, so far for Howard Johnson. He is two for two. He has singled the left and stolen the base. And he doubled his last time up into right center field. He takes the breaking ball for strike one. Hojo's been going in the opposite direction of Gary Carter. He has inched over the Mendoza line now. <laughs> He's working hard now to get above his weight. Believe me, that clubhouse is tough. When you're having a, a, you know, a good period, you're winning a lot of ball games, uh, the jiving in the clubhouse is, is always very good. When you're not hitting your weight, it's tough. Now it's strike two. The Mendoza line. It was a Mario Mendoza. Was it Mario Mendoza? Mario Mendoza played for the Pirates, among others. Who really had a lot of trouble staying over 200. He used to say he was on the interstate. That's like an I-95 or, you know, you're hitting O-95 or 195 or Mendoza line was getting over 200. High and away ball one, one and two. Got to get that crooked number up there, not that one little slash. <laughs> you know, it's tough, too, to have your career remembered by <laughs> some stat like that. Isn't it? It's the truth. He was an excellent defensive shortstop. Two and two. Ocho now hitting 218. He started the game at an even 200. So he's 18 points over the Mendoza line. Now, if 
you get hot during this early part of the season, you can really pick up a lot of points. Not to worry yet. Howard Johnson at bat. We had a ball lined foul. It's never an official Hojo at bat. Good call, Steve. So one of them is lined somewhere foul. I'll tell you what, they should have automatic uh, fences come up over the dugouts and stuff like that to protect right. the fans right. when Hojo comes up. You invent the Hojo barrier. <laughs> Plexiglass in a hockey game. Curve ball, ground and foul. Still two and two. One out and nobody on. We're in the bottom of the sixth inning with New York leading Cincinnati two to nothing. Sharon could not retrieve that one. It went under the stands. Maybe lost forever. Fastball hit a ton, but it's also a foul. I don't think I've ever seen anybody hit the ball any harder than Howard Johnson, where if you would put up the the angle of, of, of where the ball goes, foul, I mean, he hits this ball on the fat part of the bat almost. Uh, it, the ball winds up almost directly behind his back as he takes the stance. He hits the ball right behind him with tremendous authority. Great top hand. Off speed gets him for strike three. Rasmus has uh, struck out the first two hitters here in the sixth inning, and that's his fifth of the night. Shortstop, Kevin Elder. Getting that off-speed pitch right where he wants it a lot. That's not the curveball. That's like a changeup. So two out and nobody on with the strikeouts. And here's Kevin Elster, who has struck out looking and been walked intentionally, 0 for 1. Breaking ball, lined foul. Just past the fishnet. It's a good stab. He's going for it. Feels like he should have had it. From him. Tell you what, the way that fishnet looks, it might have just gone right through that fishnet. <laughs> That's right. I don't know. He's got a hole in there already. Maybe it did. <laughs> it came awfully close. It looks like he's might got be able to catch a balloon in there. I don't know about that baseball. I think that's seen its better days as a fishnet. Too. <laughs> one ball, one strike. Elster coming into tonight over the last three weeks has raised his average 131 points after a rather abysmal start at the plate. High curveball ground to short. Larkin over. Scoops it. Throws in the dirt in time. And the inning is over. Good play by Saski to help him out at the other end. A 1-2-3 inning. The first time tonight the Mets have been retired in order by Dennis Rasmussen. But New York still leads it 2 to nothing after 6. And we're back after this for the New Jersey Bell Yellow Pages. Spend some great moments with National Geographic. It's all part of A-plus for kids. Channel 9's ongoing commitment to learning. Monday night at 8. Getting ready for the seventh inning, and another big cheer goes up as the Knicks have taken the lead over the Celtics, 81 to 77. And Frank Williams, who was up earlier, is up again in the Cincinnati bullpen as Dennis Rasmussen is scheduled up third here in the seventh. Dwight Gooden has pitched six shutout innings to give the Mets now a total as a team of 26 consecutive scoreless innings that their staff has turned in. And Dwight, of course, Already with two shutouts this year and four complete games. Going after another one with a two to nothing lead. Tommy Helms managing the Reds as Pete Rose's appeal was denied by the National League's executive committee today here in New York. So apparently Tommy will manage the club the remainder of Pete's suspension. Here's Ron Renneke. And he takes a high breaking ball for ball one. Renneke just joined the Reds yesterday. Wednesday night he was playing for Nashville in Buffalo. So Thursday morning he had a 5:30 wake-up call. He flew from Buffalo to Nashville, picked up his stuff, went to Cincinnati, was in the lineup that night. Ball two. He got to the park at 6:15 for a 7:30 game. Started the game. He had two hits and three RBIs last night in his big league 88 debut. All three to Renick. 
But it was quite a day yesterday for Ron. He's back in there again tonight. He was not originally scheduled in the lineup, but Eric Davis was scratched prior to the start of the game. Ball four. Gooden walks his first batter to lead off the seventh inning. He's on National League scoreboard. Philadelphia over Atlanta, seven to three. Chicago beat San Francisco three to two. Still tied up one to one. San Diego at Second Pittsburgh. Baseman, Jeff All tied up also in the tenth inning. Extra innings. Houston at Montreal. Nine to one in the bottom of the seventh. Los Angeles over St. Louis. Jeff Treadway, the batter. He's 0 for two. He's flied out twice. And he represents the tying run with Renneke on first and nobody out. Strike one. Steve mentioned to you that Dwight Gooden has had four complete games. They've all been in the road, though. The last four times out, he's gone all the way. It's very early in the season for that. And I would say he and Clements, maybe Oral Hershiser, they have certainly come into the season ready to go. Well, Dave Stewart over in the American League, Greg Swindell from yeah, Cleveland. From Cleveland. There have already been some outstanding. I know about Swindell. He's on my rotisserie <laughs> league club, babe. Don't worry. I know all about Swindell. You can recite his stats up and down. <laughs> Just the wins. That's what counts. Wins and strikeouts. One strike to pitch. Curveball fouled off strike two. There's a, four guys in that. That a friend of mine named Thornton Geary. Len Carey, the actor who's in London right now on a play over there. He's, Probably getting he's a member of it. Probably getting that international newspaper checking those box scores every day. All the time. <laughs> and Alan's wife, Bell, who was a writer for the Gary Shandling Show. What a what a different group of people we have. A little eclectic. Owning this little rotisserie league club. An eclectic team you have. Oh. Well, Gooden obviously did not mean to do that. And he hit Jeff Treadway right in the thigh. And a pretty hard fastball. Treadway trying to get out of the way went down hard. When you leave your feet, there's no tension in your muscle. Really. It, it, and when it hits you in a, in a soft spot, it can really leave a bolt on you. Just jumping up out of the way. Boy, that hit him really solid. Trainer Larry Starr out to See if there's anything he can do. He's going to have trouble. Yeah. He's going to have trouble with that one. I'll tell you, the, the major muscle, like that thigh muscle, when you get a deep bruise like that, it really impairs the function of it. That's what similarly happened to Bobby Ojeda. It caused him to have to leave a game. It just makes it very difficult for that muscle to function normally. Even though when you think of a bruise, you don't think of a serious injury. But Treadway's staying in there and is at first base, telling first base coach Lee May about it. Pitch hitting number 22. And the Dave Reds Collins. now have the tying runs aboard with nobody out here in the seventh inning against Gooden. And Dave Collins will be the pinch hitter for Dennis Rasmussen. Rasmussen pitched a pretty good six innings. Collins on the season, as you see, is hitting 158. Three hits and 19 at bats. So he has not hit a tremendous amount of playing time. Treadway the second batter this year that Gooden has hit. So first and second with nobody out. Ground ball up the middle could be trouble is through and in for a base hit. Here comes Renicky and he will score as the throw goes into second to stop Treadway there and the shutout is gone and it is now two to one New York as Collins comes through with an RBI base hit pinch hitting. Not trying to pull this ball. Mike Gooden with fastball sinking. Goes right back through the middle. Gets a nice hop off that hard ground in front of home plate. Sneaks it through the middle. Gets the Reds on the scoreboard. Ninth hit for Cincinnati. Still nobody out. Still runners at first and second. And the batter Barry Larkin, who is two for three. Hernandez in looking for the bunt.
Johnson also ahead of the bag at third, but they'd obviously like to get the runner at third on the force if at all possible. Bunts it up in the air, foul, no play, and it's strike one. You could tell Larkin was going to bunt all the way there. He shouldn't have done that. He didn't stay in his regular stance. He kind of opened up a little more than normal. You can see that he had the bat in position to bunt. He wanted to make sure he got the bat head out. See how wide he is here. Now, he has an open stance normally, but he had that all set up for a bunt. Gave Keith Hernandez a good reason to be in. Here's Howard Johnson just a little bit ahead of the bag at third. Let's see if he stays with it here. Hernandez again now he swings away and fouls it off of his leg and a count on two gave him a good decoy it's aggressive baseball I like that this a bunt they're charging you you bunt into Keith Hernandez if you bunt the first base you're going to wind up getting a double play problem you didn't get everything back in time you got to work on that play it's not so easy Especially against someone who throws as hard as Dwight Gooden. The ball is on top of you in a hurry. Now Hernandez and Johnson move way back with a count of two strikes. And a ground ball foul outside of third. The count remaining 0-2. Larkin, as the leadoff hitter, has really been doing the job as far as getting on base is concerned. Not only is he hitting 320 going into this at bat, but he has been on base now in 25 of the Reds 27 games. Well he scored 19 runs and he's driven in 12. So he has done all that the Cincinnati Red Lakes won out of a leadoff hitter. A conference on the mound with Elster, Gooden, and Carter now over. No balls, two strikes. Dwight Gooden called for that meeting. I don't know whether he thinks somebody at second base might be indicating location or what pitch is coming. Certainly Treadway is not a veteran. It doesn't mean he can't be smart. Just outside with a fastball, one and two. Here in the seventh inning, the Mets' consecutive scoreless inning streak stopped at 26 in a row. As the Reds have scored one and have runners at first and second with nobody out. A fastball grounded up the middle and could be two. Elster flips it. And the throw in time to get Larkin at first on the double play. On the play, Treadway goes to third, but now there are two gone. Larkin with good speed. That's, there was only a little decision whether he should take this himself or not. He decides to give a quick flip. Good turn. And they just beat him at first base. Very close play. Good job by Tuffle to turn that as quickly as possible. And here's Chris Sabo, who is one for three with an infield base hit. Batting with a tying run at third and two out. Fastball, base hit, and the game is tied. Wilson over to cut it off, and Chris Sabo, who has really been doing the job in replacing Buddy Bell, the third baseman who's on the DL, comes through yet again, and the game is tied. We're going to start calling Buddy Bell Wally Pitt. As you said, he's been very consistent, Steve. Just been doing everything they've asked of him, too. Good line drive, right back through the middle. See a lot of the balls of the Reds have hit today. Left the successful balls Daniel. that hit have been the balls they have not tried to pull and over, overpower with Dwight Good, going right back through the box with him. Certainly have been the successful hits for them. And they have tied the game up with two here in the seventh, and Cal Daniels will be the batter. Daniels, one for three, single to center to lead off the fourth inning. Sabo looked to be leaning, and Gooden nearly got him. Sabo has stolen 12 of 13 attempts. He was leaning on that one. Very close play. He does just get that hand back in there. Again, Dana DeMuth making a nice call. Sabo has stolen 12 in 13 attempts. And the 
Reds, of course, lead the National League in stolen bases. They now have stolen 55 successful in 67 attempts. Sabo's running, a pitch out, and Carter's throw right there. The inning is over, but the Cincinnati Reds scored two runs with the help of a walk, a hit batter, and two base hits. And in the middle of the seventh, it's tied 2-2. Now here's a word from Michelo. Fans, a reminder that the Reds complete their visit to Shea Stadium Saturday and Sunday this weekend, and Saturday, Hans Frank's Kids Jersey Day. May 7th is a sellout, but there are still plenty of seats left for the game on Sunday, May 8th. That's, of course, Mother's Day. You can get tickets to all Mets games at Shea Stadium's advanced ticket window at all Ticketron outlets or call Teletron. You can also get ticket information by calling 718-507-TIXX during regular business hours. The Mets go on the road for two weeks following this homestand, so make sure to get out to Shea next weekend and see the Mets before they take off. I guess it's instead of next weekend, it's this weekend. And this weekend will feature these Cincinnati Reds. Here's Frank Williams, a new pitcher, replacing Dennis Rasmussen as we go to the bottom of the seventh. You'll see an 0-0 record, 3.14 earned run average. He's walked nine, struck out ten, and given up 15 hits and 14 Ladies and one third and innings. Now pitching for so he has and really struggled at times. He had to, even though his earned run average is low. Frank Williams. 15 hits and 14 and a third innings and almost as many walks as strikeouts. It well, is never good for anybody, much less a relief pitcher. No. Dennis Rasmussen pitched well. In six innings, he gave up two earned runs on five hits. He struck out five. He walked three. One of those was an intentional pass. So no decision for Rasmussen as the Reds help him out with two runs in the top half of the seventh. And the doctor will lead off the seventh inning for New York. Mookie Wilson and Tim Temple to follow. And a 2-2 tie. Doc tonight 0 for 2 is struck out and popped to second. And the doctor got himself in trouble in the seventh. He walked the leadoff hitter Renicky and then hit Treadway to put the tying runs aboard and they both scored. Sidearm delivery nubbed out in front of the plate. Williams in a hurry gets Gooden one away. Last year for Cincinnati, he had a 4 0 record with a couple of saves. See that unusual sidearm delivery he has. Makes kind of a nice play here. That's probably the highest he's come over the top in a long, long time. He threw that ball from upstairs. He didn't want to throw a slider to first, <laughs> he didn't want to sink it in the dirt. Here's Mookie Wilson, swing and a miss. Foul tipped into Bo Diaz, catcher's mid strike one. Mookie has an 11-game hitting streak on the line as he is 0 for 3. Williams, every once in a while, especially against left-handed hitters, has tried to come up on top a little more because he, some years, has really struggled against them. That one's a little low, 1-1. One one. With that sidearm delivery, you can get that natural break right into the hitter's wheelhouse with the left-handed hitter up there. If you don't do something different. That one broke down and in. Mookie swinging at a bad ball, really. It's one ball, two strikes. That's a key pitch for him, though. That's the one pitch that can keep those left-handers off balance. This is the perfect location for him. A slider that appears to be a fastball and then breaks in off the plate. If that pitch is a strike, it's a good pitch to hit. He's got to get it in on those left-handers. Way up and away, two and two. He was up a little bit on that one. That was not his normal sidearm delivery. No, that ball really appeared to sail, too. Now Rob Murphy throwing in the Cincinnati bullpen. Fouled away, and the count still two and two. Murphy out there throwing because should the Mets get Wilson or Tuffle or both aboard, 
Keith Hernandez and Daryl Strawberry, at least one of them, could come to the plate. And Tommy Helms wants to have that left hander ready just in case. Nookie lays off the high off speed pitch, three and two now. Again, that was an off speed pitch, a changeup, and he came over the top much more on that pitch. So you've seen a fastball and a changeup from that kind of over the top delivery. Three and two is inside, and Mookie is aboard with one out here in the seventh inning. This is a Nissan American League scoreboard. Baltimore, oh, Chicago in Baltimore was postponed Second because of rain. Two. Minnesota ahead of Boston five to nothing in the eighth. Also in the eighth, Milwaukee over Kansas City two to nothing. Seven one Texas over New York now, bottom of the seventh. Detroit and Seattle just getting underway. Detroit's ahead one nothing, bottom of the second. Cleveland and Oakland no score yet. Toronto at California. They've tied up one apiece, bottom of the second. One out, one on for New York here in the seventh, and the batter Tim Tuffle, who is one for two plus a walk. Tommy Helms moving some people around from the dugout. Telling him to go straight away right there. Tuffle went back through the middle and got a, a single last, well, a second time up. Wilson kept close at first. Mookie does not yet have a stolen base this year. He has been caught stealing one time. But I don't think that that's the final score. The Celtics came back and defeated the Knicks 102 to 94. They came back big in the fourth quarter. Strike call to Tim Tuffle. The Celtics have won that NBA playoff series three games to one to advance in the NBA Finals. The Knicks, after a really a fine showing. Uh, Rick Pitino and that whole group, the uh, city of New York, should be very proud of what they've done. Coming back from the doldrums to get in the playoffs and play some real hard basketball. They gave them a great season. And they gave the Celtics a pretty good run. Outside, one ball, one strike. They came back in the fourth quarter to take the lead over the Celtics, but Boston pulled away, and the New Jersey Devils have lost. Boston led this really from the outset in the NHL playoffs tonight, six to one over New Jersey. It's now two games to one in favor of Boston. Good play by Sasky as Williams threw it in the dirt. He's made a couple of good pickups over at first base on some throws from the infielders. That time he did it from the pitcher. One ball, one strike to Tuffle with Wilson at first and one out. He's another guy like Johnny Bench who has a, a massive hand. I mean, big hands. Can't hurt. Mookie's running. Fouled off for strike two. Well, the game, uh, Timmy and I were in the press room and Johnny Bench came in shook my hand I thought I lost it <laughs> JB's got a meat hook on him oh boy he's got to get those extra thick pads on his golf clubs <laughs> uh, Sasky not only large hands but good hands as did Johnny Bench have the good hands oh yes one ball two strikes guaranteed future Hall of Famer Johnny Bench. Wilson dances back in. As we said earlier in the broadcast, Gary Carter very close to Johnny Bench now. Home runs. Gain him on him daily. Big question for Gary is how much longer will he continue to catch as many games as he has. Wilson's running again on a line drive foul. Outside the right field line, and the count still one and two. On that play, the Cincinnati Redlegs made a switch. They had the shortstop cover, not the second baseman. Normally, the second baseman would cover with a with a right-handed pull hitter up. So Mookie Wilson taking a peek. You have to take a peek when you're going down there. Sometimes when you're stealing all the way uh, in certain situation, maybe you don't look because some guys maybe they say they're going to lose half a step if they look, but. 98% of the time, you've got to take a look. Know where that batter is. You can see Mookie adjust around the bag when he knew that the ball had been hit. 
still one and two to Tuffle. And again, Wilson draws a throw. Two two tie, bottom of the seventh inning, one out. Certainly the catcher has to be considering a, a pitch out in a situation like this. But when your pitcher throws over to first base twice, I would not think so. Activity beginning now in the New York bullpen as Randy Myers is up in throw. One and two. Wilson not running on a pitch out. Cat and mouse going on. That's where you see Randall K getting loose. Well, again, if, if they had not thrown over to first base twice, that might have had a better chance of working, in my opinion. I, you know, if you're going to try a pitch out, why throw over to first base to keep him closer? Well, then there's another school of thought that you throw over to first to get him thinking you're not going to pitch out. Yeah, but you're reading that thing they head up in Whitey's, Whitey's office. Mookie running, and the throw in the dirt. It's in the center field. Wilson goes to third. Stolen base and a throwing error on Diaz, allowing Wilson to go to third, where he is in an excellent scoring position with still only one out. Tough ball for him to handle in the dirt. He comes up. He does not make a good throw. It's in front of the bag. It's a tough play for the shortstop, but he's got to try to knock this ball down. He just reaches. In fact, he doesn't even reach in for that ball. A little afraid of the slide coming in the second base. You can see Larkin jump out of the way, and Bo Diaz obviously not thrilled either with his throw or the result. Infield in all the way around, and Tuffle strikes out on a breaking ball. Big strikeout for Frank Williams as now there are two away. Good side on breaking ball. Tuffle misses it. Give Williams a lot of credit. Good pitch. And the pitching change will be made. Scott Breeden, the pitching coach, out of the dugout with Keith Hernandez coming up. They want the left-hander in the game to face Keith. Two out here in the bottom of the seventh inning. A 2-2 tie with Mookie Wilson at third base. And while they change, we'll take time out for American Airlines. Frank Williams sits down after working two-thirds of an inning. He is responsible for Mookie Wilson to go ahead and run at third base. And into the game, left-hander Rob Murphy to face Keith Hernandez. Last year, Murphy was 8-5 and five with a 3.04 earn run average. This year, he's 0-2 with a 1.67 or 6-9. He walked 10, struck out 11, given up 14 hits and 16 innings pitched. He has not had a save yet. Rob Murphy, number 46. A reminder, you're watching Mets Baseball 88 on WWOR-TV, Secaucus, New Jersey. Some exuberant Mets fans. Some of the 23,500 on hand here tonight, about half as many as bought tickets for this game because of the inclement weather showed up. A paid crowd of 22,857, 23,451 total. And the advance sale for this game was in excess of 45,000. So here's Keith. One for two, plus a walk, a stolen base, and a run score. And a big run it was at the time, but Cincinnati has since tied it. These are the situations where I think as a catcher, this guy is going to throw Keith Hernandez a breaking ball somewhere along the line, and that catcher's thinking, don't throw it in the dirt. You know, he's just coming into the ball game. They like to let him get his feet wet, but he can't. Now with a runner at third, that represents the go-ahead run. We'll have to ask Timmy McCarver if that's some of the things that might have entered his mind every once in a while with a new pitcher coming in. Especially with a runner of Wilson's speed. At third base, the fastball is high, ball one. That ball doesn't have to bounce very far away from home plate for Mookie Wilson to be able to score. And Murphy did come with a fastball. 
Hernandez has driven in 16 runs in the last eight games. And that one on the inside corner makes it one and one. These are the tough RBIs. These are the ones that you get paid for. You see Darryl Strawberry on deck. Two outs, man on third. Tough left-hander up. Keith tried to get out of the way and fouled it off into the Cincinnati dugout. You see Tony Perez yelling at him. <laughs> a little static. Tell him to get the bat out. Mario Soto won't be laughing at me. If he does anything against him tomorrow, but tonight's a, a free night. When you're not on the mound, everything can be funny. Keith's not laughing. That was ball two, and it winds up being strike two. One and two. You want to just bat them, or rather bite the knob off the end of the bat when you do something like Keith that. Keith had a lot of great years in this situation. Last year, he struggled right here. Fouls it off into the screen. The count still one and two. He had a tough start of the season, driving minute in scoring position, but then he really finished strong. He wound up hitting about two, the high 250s with men in scoring position. But in this the exact situation right here, a man on third and two outs, he hit less than 200. And the year before, 1986, when the Mets won the World's Championship, Keith Hernandez was the best in baseball with a runner at third and two outs. Line drive caught by Sabo, and the inning is over. The Mets leave a runner at third here in the seventh inning after a walk and a stolen base. We say so long to Rusty Staub, and Tim McCarver will join me right after this for the good old sky. Nobody writes a column like Mike Lupica. Nobody tells it like the Daily News. In my column, I like to stay clear of controversy. If you can't say something nice, why say anything at all? Players and managers, who are just trying to do their job. Who am I to point out every little mistake? Spread a little sunshine, that's my job. <laughs> and they say I'm nuts. Nobody tells it like the Daily News. New York, come down, baby. Could they win the Stanley Cup final? The Devils in semi-final action tonight, and Senator Alphonse D'Amato takes the stand in the WedTech trial. Details after the game. It's a 2-2 tie as we go to the eighth inning. Dwight Gooden's scoreless personal streak has ended at 20 innings with the two runs in the seventh that he gave up. And his scoreless streak against the Cincinnati Reds was 24 consecutive innings until the seventh. And, of course, the Mets overall as a staff a streak of 26 consecutive innings ended. Let's and as we go to the eighth, coming in to call it for you with me, for, with me, for you, <laughs> something like that, a fellow who's no stranger to scoreless innings, catching the likes of Bob Gibson and Steve Carlton. Tim McCarthy. I thought you were going to say offensively. <laughs> no stranger to scoreless innings. No. I wonder if the 1957 rock trivia song could apply now. Jim Dandy to the rescue. Dwight Gooden really has had no rescue in his last five ball games. Four complete games, and he's worked seven full innings in this game as Cal Daniels takes ball one. 1-0 one to Cal, who is one for three on the night. Curve ball inside, 2-0. Oh. Steve, we were talking between, between innings with Randy Myers up the last inning. You would have to assume that if the Mets had scored in the bottom of the second, Myers would be in to pitch to Daniels and O'Neill. That's an assumption. Foul away, two and one. But an assumption based on the fact that if that were not the case, why was he throwing? <laughs> exactly. Good did lead off the bottom of the seventh, and he tapped back to Frank Williams. One of those hits, a home run for Daniels. 2-2 two -two game, top of the eight. On the outside corner, 2-2. Two two. Daniels has a good eye, and he questions this call. He leads the National League and walks, starting play tonight with 24. Eight of them coming in just the last four games. Outside, ball three. 3-2 three to Cal Daniels. Ball 
tapped in front of the plate. Gooden will have to hurry out at first base. And I mean, he just got it. That ball almost died out there, didn't it? Well, it's been raining the whole game, and the infield is now quite wet with the tarp having been removed some hours ago. Gooden is waiting for this ball, and it just doesn't continue to roll as he anticipates it's going to. He's there, he's there. Now look at how long it takes the ball to get to where he went. And it's just a half a step. The margin by which he is able to get Daniels at first base. We've seen Gooden do that a lot of times with Paul O'Neill, the batter. He's two for three. Fly ball deep to left. McReynolds will have to hurry. A nice play by Kevin McReynolds. Two outs. Kevin McReynolds one of the best technical outfielders around, breaks on this ball with his head down, running into the corner, and then picks up the ball and makes the catch. He knew that he had to go full bore to get to where the ball was going to be. It's funny, that's exactly what I was going to say about Good. He has such a presence as a pitcher and a fielder. I would have loved to have seen him on a basketball court, and I would have loved to have seen Kevin McReynolds on a basketball court. The great instincts of both of those athletes. Nick Kosaski on the first pitch pops to shallow right and Strawberry. So after running the 3 2 count to Daniels, Good retires two hitters on two pitches. It's 2 to 2, middle of the eighth. We're back after this from Tropicana. Crazy Eddie strikes again. Huh? 2 to 2, bottom of the eighth inning. Rob Murphy, the third pitcher of the night for the Cincinnati Reds. Dennis Rasmussen started for the Reds, and he pitched well. He gave up two runs in six innings, and Frank Williams came in. He worked two-thirds of an inning. Leading on for the Mets. Tim Tuffle striking out with Mookie Wilson on third base in the seventh inning and one out, and then Hernandez's line drive when Murphy entered. And the batter, Darryl Strawberry, here in the bottom of the eighth, Strawberry has driven in both runs with a sacrifice fly and a single. Darrell one for two. And the crowd with the Darrell Darrell that they have turned into a positive thing. Pirates one again. Three run homer by Sid Bream off Mark Davis in the bottom of the 12th inning. Slider to Strawberry, strike one. 0-1 oh, to Darrell. 2-2, two, two, bottom of the eighth. The Reds and the Mets. Another strike on the fastball, 0-2. Oh, a lot of people pointed to the Pirates' West Coast road trip as a real watershed time for that team to see if, in fact, they're going to be for real. And they're responding. Strike three on the outside corner. Strikeout number one for... Rob Murphy, one away. Well, Darrell's ready. He just can't pull the trigger. And that pitch, a good-looking fastball in a hittable location. Darrell possibly looking for something else. Looking for a right-hander. <laughs> That's what I would be doing if I were facing Murphy. I'll guarantee you he can get you out if you're a left-handed hitter. 0-1 to Kevin McReynolds. He's 0 for 3. Straight strikes by Murphy, and he is blowing. Well, that one was some straight gas right there. Jose Rijo now throwing in the bullpen. Murphy due up number fourth in the top of the ninth. Ground ball right side. Treadway throws to first. So Murphy has thrown six strikes in this inning. He's retired two in the batter, Gary Carter. Gary Carter. Big day for Murphy tomorrow, I would imagine, with private terms, the favorite in the Kentucky Derby. Robbie with a deep interest in breeding racehorses, thoroughbreds, as a matter of fact. Hales from Miami, Florida, and I believe his grandfather was a, a big horse breeder, a famous horse breeder. I believe he is the person that got Robbie interested in that. He is a very, very accomplished, from what I understand, horse breeder. Ball and no strikes to Gary Carter. 
Well, he'll be hoping for a fast game tomorrow so yeah. he can catch the derby. That's right. 2 0. You saw that final. The Dodgers have defeated the Cardinals 10 2. And Fernando wins again. Two out, nobody on. We're in the bottom of the eighth inning of a 2 2 ball game. There's a strike. Two balls and a strike to Gary Carter. Tim McCarver along with Steve Zabriskie, Rusty Staub, Ralph Kiner. Happy you've joined us tonight. This game delayed 50 minutes by rain. Official start 826. Gary fouling it away. Two and two to Carter. very happy to get this game in because with last night's rain out it's already a five game series coming up with the first of July against Houston and the Reds come back in right behind the Astros well hit to left field but heavy air this evening ball is going nowhere and that's why Cal Daniels makes the play the Mets go in order in the eighth and after eight two to two and we're back after this from Mitsubishi Motors as we go to the ninth inning and those fans who braved the elements seen a good ball game tonight this fellow was prepared and figured if the game wasn't played he could go on safari <laughs> trying to find the right camera please will tie in wood please report to the press gate that's tie in wood okay Dwight Gooden, who has yet to lose this season, catcher Bo Diaz. locked up now in a 2-2 tie as we go to the ninth inning. Bo Diaz, who has hit the doctor well, Ron Renneke and Jeff Treadway scheduled to face him here in the ninth. Diaz has singled, struck out, and grounded into a double play. White was leading two to nothing going into the seventh inning. Walked the first hitter, hit the next batter, and both of them score. Curve ball, way high, ball two. The opposition has only scored on the Mets in the last 45 innings in two separate innings. The seventh inning tonight and the seventh inning of the three to one ball game. Ron Gann had the three-run double against Darling the other night. That's been it. Strike one, two and one. That includes the ninth inning of last Saturday night's controversial game. So that's a total of five runs in 45 innings of work. Well, and that's that. 43 of those innings were blanks. Hopped up and playable in the infield. Elster taking charge and taking the ball. Out number one. No surprise when you consider those pitching statistics. The Mets have won 10 of their last 12 ball games. It's hard to lose when you don't give up. Any runs. Renicki is 0 for 2. So he hit a soft liner to second and grounded to short, or grounded to second rather, and then he walked and scored, leading off the seventh inning. Ball one. If you are one of the many who have tickets for the Monday, May 30th game here at Shea. You should know that the time has been changed. Right one, one and one. Start time of that ball game was originally 1.30, and it will now be 8 o'clock in the evening. So if you have tickets for Monday, May 30th, it's now an 8 o'clock p.m. ball game. John Franco throwing in the bullpen as the ball is lost it into left center. And Renicki is retired for out number two. Doc's almost pitching mad now. He's retired five in a row Second since the two runs here. in the seventh inning, and all the great ones have that. That look of resolve you can see in Dwight Gooden's eyes. We've seen it come over him since he was a 19-year-old rookie. Jeff Treadway now with two on, with two out, nobody on, takes a high fastball for ball one. 
Treadway, 0 for 2, was hit by a pitch in the seventh and scored the tying run. Two balls, no strikes. on base tonight. Six by Cincinnati and seven by New York. Cincinnati with ten hits. And the Mets with just five. And a 2-2 two -two tie. Two out top of the line. Ground ball foul. Two and two the count to Treadwood. Like approach. Grounded by Hernandez for a base hit into right field. Keith shaded over toward the line, trying to keep the extra base hit from putting a runner in scoring position, just could not get to it. Well, Treadway had, had grounded that 2 1 pitch foul down the first baseline, and I think that pushed. Hernandez toward the line a little bit. You're exactly right. He dashed for it, the ball going under his glove. That's one situation where you, you, it's reasonable to guard the line because there are two outs. You don't want double single. You want single, single, single. You can do that with nobody out because you've got outs to work with. With two outs, you got one out to work with. So basically now, unless they get a long double from Lloyd McClendon or different dimension stolen base from that man who's got a stiff neck we'll see how stiff it is Eric Davis is a pinch runner now for Treadway he comes in to, to steal a base <laughs> it's kind of strange because that means I'm not saying he should have started or anything but how stiff is his neck ladies and gentlemen well he's had a few hours for Jim Treadway and Eric Davis okay. Pitching in number 30, Lloyd McClendon. Reaching. But he's in there. Lloyd McClendon hitting 182. No homers or RBIs as the pinch hitter. Batting for Rob Murphy, the pitcher. McClendon as a pinch hitter is 0 for 2 this year. pinch running for Treadway and Lloyd McClendon hitting for Rob Murphy with two out. 12 stolen bases for Davis, 50 last year. But his neck's all right, he's running. He has only been caught one time. He's not running on this pitch. It's a breaking ball in the dirt for ball one. Eric originally in the lineup. But when the delay was announced, Scratched from the lineup. Renicky taking his place. Well, I 
I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of kidding, but I'm kind of serious. I mean, if you can't start a ball game, how can you come in and pinch run without loosening up? I think a point can be made there. I don't know really what point it is, well, but I would think it would be tougher to steal a base with a stiff neck than it would be to play a whole game with a stick, stiff neck. One thing about coming in as a pinch runner, though, is that he did not have to face Dwight Gooden. As well, a that's that's true. That's not really my point, but that that is true. If your neck's bothering you by looking to your left, if it's bothering you by looking to your right, and you were a left-handed hitter, I could understand sitting out. So I guess it's bothering Eric to look to his left. That's why he could look to his right and know where second base was and steal it, right? So we figured it out. Has to be. Ball three to McClendon, and it's now 3-0. Tommy Helms, the current manager. Tommy said that he's going to meet with General Manager Murray Cook and Pete Rose, determine if he will, in fact, manage the entire suspension. Three and one to McClendon, taking all the way. Tying run at second base with two out in the ninth inning. I should say the go-ahead run for Cincinnati. Eric Davis's great speed. Ball four. Now runners at first and second with two out, and on the positive side of it for New York, a force at any base at home. Barry Larkin. On the negative side of it, the hitter is Barry Larkin who is two for four tonight and for his career young as it may be has had five hits in 14 at bats against Dwight Gooden. Yeah Doc just couldn't find the strike zone and Davey, no Davey Johnson knows that couldn't find the strike zone against Lloyd McClendon He'd much rather challenge the pinch hitter and that's what he was trying to do but too high Davis running for third Carter's throw is to second not in time. Carter trying to get the slower runner McClendon and the double steal works for Cincinnati as they now have runners at second and third with two out. Well, credit McClendon being very alert and Lloyd getting down in second base. Carter making the proper throw. You're not going to get Eric Davis if he has any kind of jump. And that's the fourth stolen base of the night for the Cincinnati Reds. Strike to count to Larkin. A high fastball makes it one and one. Grounded to short. Elster throws out Larkin and the inning is over. A base hit and a walk with two out, but the doctor pitches out of the jam and we go to the bottom of the ninth. Still tied 2-2 after this for AT&T. Dave Concepcion becomes the new second baseman here in the bottom of the ninth inning for Cincinnati and the new pitcher for the Reds, New York's own John Franco. John, a Lafayette High School graduate, grew up in Brooklyn, 0-1 on the Cincinnati. year, with four Cincinnati saves. Team, number 13, Dave Concepcion. And we'll remind you what that one loss was. That was now the for Saturday game, six days ago, when Mark John Johnson Franco. led off the inning with a walk, was sacrificed to second base, and then on the play, where Mookie hit the ball, the shortstop Barry Larkin, he threw high to a Sasky. All the fireworks started, and it resulted in the suspension of Pete Rose for 30 days. And a win for the Mets and a loss for Franco. Leading off for New York. Who's leading off the inning? Third baseman, Howard Johnson. Howard Johnson, who is two for three tonight. Hojo with a single in the second inning and a double in the fourth, then struck out in the sixth. 2-2 tie, bottom of the ninth. Elster... And then Gooden 
scheduled to follow as Tommy Helms goes over the lineup card. Pete Rose back in the hotel. Not here at the ballpark tonight. Outside, ball one. Pete will be allowed to go to the ballpark, but once the game starts, he will not be allowed to be in the dugout or in the clubhouse or anywhere close to the dugout where he might be able to give signs. Ground ball to second. David Concepcion gets his first shot, and there's one out in the bottom of the ninth inning. In a regular season game, I think it's important to remember that before this season, Dwight Gooden had gone the distance 47 times. He's done it four times this year. Five, five times he's done it in losing efforts, gone the distance. He has never pitched more than nine innings in a regular season game, and for that reason, Lee Mazzilli's on deck. Kevin Elster takes low and away, ball one. And there's Mans. And there's the doctor. The doc has a no decision at this point. Strike one, one and one to Elster. And of course, stands to win the ball game if the Mets can score here in the bottom of the ninth. If they do not, it'll be the no decision for Dwight, who has yet to lose this year. Elster is struck out looking and grounded to short. Fouls it right off the end of the bat. One ball, two strikes. Kevin was also walked intensely back in the fourth. Nor did Doc go more than nine innings in the playoff series against Houston. He lost to Mike Scott one to nothing in the opening game. And then in game five with Nolan Ryan, it was 1-1 one, one after nine. Gooden was taken out, and Ryan, I think, went ten innings. I believe that's right. I think you're right. Fisher, and there are two out here in the ninth. So Lee Mazzilli will pinch hit for Dwight Gooden, who is out of the game, having gone nine innings. Two earned runs on 11 hits. He struck out five and walked two. He can win it, but he cannot lose it. Nance, did you see, hitting 133. Now batting number 13, Lee Mazzilli. A track ties a career high and hits yielded in a ball game by Gooden. He had 11 hits against him against the Expos to win a game, but that was only in five innings on opening day up in Montreal. And giving up 11 hits tonight. Grounded into the hole and Larkin's over there to get it. And just does get Mazzilli at first base as Maz busted it down the line. But it's a 1-2-3 inning here in the ninth. And we go to extra innings on a damp evening. And New York still tied 2-2 after this for Michelob. Top of the 10th inning, Ralph Kiner in, and so is Randy Myers. Randy with a record... One and all, earned run average of zero. He's walked one, struck out five, and given up five hits in seven and one third innings, and he's had four saves. And he is working to Chris Sabo in the first pitcher call strike. Mets playing their first extra inning ball game of this short season, and the Reds have played seven. They are three and four. This pitch foul back out of play as Myers comes back with another fastball. Means a quarter of the uh, the Reds' games almost have been actually a little more than a quarter have been extra inning ball games. I think one of their extra inning games was 16 innings. And the pitch high, a fastball again, one ball, two strikes. Reds two runs on 11 hits. They made one error. The Mets have two runs on six hits, and they made no errors. I think they had five hits. Pull foul. Randy with a fine 
start this year and of course throughout this ball game it's been raining very lightly off and on it was doubtful the game would even be played and they had a 50 minute rain delay before the game got started still a paid crowd of 22,857 had an advanced sale that would have brought in about 45,000. High ball to deep left field. It is way back going. It is gone. Goodbye. Chris Sabo with a home run. That is the first home run, earn run given up by Randy Myers this year. And it puts the Reds on top three to two. Number six for Sabo, who is doing just a terrific job filling in for Buddy Bell. And you wonder if that's what it's going to be when and if Buddy Bell returns this year. He gets all of this, baby. Wow. The Reds get their 30th home run of the year, and the pitch to Cal Daniels is ball one. Third hit for Sabo in this game. Pitch back to Daniels, a ball, and it's two balls and no strikes. Cal Daniels, one for four tonight. And a strike call, so they can have two balls and one strike. led one nothing after one two nothing after five the Reds got two in the seventh to tie it and now one here in the top of the tenth to lead it leading by a score of three to two two to two the count as Daniels fouls off a fastball and the breaking ball for a ball full count three and two Hit to the second base side. Tough play for Tuffle. He slides in the wet grass, has no chance to make the throw. And the runner's on. A little broken bat base hit, and because Myers was falling toward the third right base side, Tuffle is the only one who can make the play and fails to make the play. Slips on that wet turf. So an infield base hit for Cal Daniels, his second base hit of the game. And it brings up Paul O'Neill, the right fielder in the game. Paul with two hits and four at bats. One of his hits a bunt. Daniels a threat to run at first base. He has good speed. They're looking for the sacrifice and the first pitch ball one. O'Neill hitting in the fourth position in the batting order. It's lefty to lefty. You go bunt in this situation. That's not Eric Davis hitting. <laughs> I'm surprised Eric Davis wasn't hitting. And that pitch for a ball, one ball, one strike. Eric Davis entered the game in the ninth inning as a pinch runner and stole two bases. Did not start tonight's ball game. Stiff neck. One pitch and the bun is hard right back to Myers a throw that pulls Elster off the bag but he does stay on it long enough to get the force play at second they lose any chance at all for a possible double play I'll tell you that ball looked like it hit the heel of the for glove of Davis Elster down. and I'm not too sure he had control of the ball when he came off the bag or when he was on the bag really See how that ball's rolling around? You've got to have control of the ball when you're on the bag. Did a good job of trying to hide it from the umpire. He sure did. That ball rolling around in there like a matzo ball in a <laughs> bowl of soup. <laughs> now the batter's Nick is Saski, and he takes for ball one. Like matzo ball soup? Yeah, yeah, too. Saski, 0 for 4 tonight, but he's hit a couple of balls extremely hard to the outfield. 
Ball swing and bounce the fastball back out of play. I don't think Randy Myers knows the meaning of anything but hard, hard, hard. And when he throws to, as you see Roger McDowell getting ready, when, when Randy throws to bases a lot of times, he throws that ball. I mean, he humps it up, and he really humped up when throwing to Kevin Elster. But when you think about it, infielders aren't really ready for a lot of those balls sometimes, usually because they give each other soft throws. That's right. True throws. And if a pitcher wants to be anything, it's not true. He's not that far away from it. That's either. right. Yeah. One and one the count. One and two. Nick Osaski at 272 last year. Right around that mark, right at this point of the season. Two pitch. Randy with that fastball. He's been clocked right around 93, 94 miles an hour. Yeah, his off-speed pitch is really his hard slider. That's as slow a pitch as he throws. Drops from 92 to 90. Here's the one-two pitch again. Strikes him out. That's the slider right here. It's high and out of the strike zone, but Sasky goes fishing. First strikeout for Randy Myers, the sixth in the ball game. Gooden had five and nine innings. Left the ball game after giving up 11 hits and nine innings and two runs. And Bo Diaz misses the fastball. Strike one. Diaz one for four. Looking ahead, the Mets will have the top of their batting order coming up in the bottom half of the tenth. Fastball foul back. Strike two. So Myers on top of the two-strike count. Trailing three to two, two men out, half of the tenth. The runner goes, the pitch is swung on and foul. And Diaz loses the bat. Bo Diaz, an excellent two strike hitter. He does not strike out a lot, and that's one reason he can reach that ball six, seven inches off the edge of the plate. Still make contact. It's a lot of balls to right field with a two-strike count. That was not a protection on a hit run play. No. He was just trying he to keep from striking out. Right. Two strikes again. Runner does not go, and again he fouls off a pitch that was tough to hit. Strike two again. the tenth against Randy Myers. One run on two hits, one left to score at the end of nine and a half innings. The Reds three, the New York Mets two. Now here's a word from Budweiser. For 100 years, National Geographic has been introducing man to the rest of his family. And in that century, there have been some very great moments. Channel 9 presents a tribute to the National Geographic Society featuring highlights from their spectacular award-winning television specials. Spend some great moments with National Geographic. It's all part of A-plus for kids. Channel 9's ongoing commitment to learning. Monday night at 8. First extra inning ball game for the New York Mets are coming up in the bottom of the 10th, needing one to tie and two to win, and a tough man on the mound for the Reds. John Franco. Franco with one loss this year and the run that scored against him was unearned it was by the Mets last Sunday 
And he has picked up four saves. So a chance to get his first victory here as he works in the tenth to Mookie Wilson, Tim Tuffle, and Keith Hernandez as his first three batter. And the big run in the ball game, Chris Sabo. I remember Sabo had the base hit in the seventh inning to tie it off to White Good. That tied the game, and now in the tenth, he puts the Reds ahead. So Chris Sabo continuing his fine job for the Reds. And Mookie Wilson batting from the right-hand side. Mookie 0 for 3 tonight is 11-game hitting streak in jeopardy, hitting 271. Franco with a fastball for ball one. Go back, it's topped over the mound, and the shortstop Larkin charging. He comes up throwing and picks up the out. Fine shortstop. Barry Larkin. That'll bring up Tim Tuffle. Tim one for three tonight. A single to center field. He also walked and scored back in the first. Tim Tuffle. the tenth inning the Mets trailing three to two and a good hard breaking ball for strike one Tuffle hitting 218 against John Franklin and this ball fouled off strike two Jimmy's going for the crank on those two swings fastballs outside he's trying to tie this game up so a two strike count no one has hit a home run off Franco this year and he goes with a sinking fastball one ball two strikes With the dead spin the right handers Almost that dead fastball outside. He throws it hard, but it's a really a, a funky looking pitch. And this ball hit out to right field. Moving it back is O'Neill, and he takes it right in front of the wall. So Franco getting some help from his right fielder, and the Mets are now down to their last out as Keith Hernandez comes in. First baseman. Well, tough of a just and just misses hitting the wall in right field. That's what we mean when we talk about right fielders, even with a guy who can muscle up on the ball, play him shallow the other way, because as you saw, Tuffle using his arms and not his body, and O'Neill caught it right in front of the fence. So it's up to Keith Hernandez to keep it alive. Keith with a base hit and three times up. Also has walked and scored. And the fastball for ball one. Strikes on the Mets. Hope it continues with Strawberry. Hernandez walks.
walking on four pitches and Darrell Strawberry the batter Darrell with a run battered in in the first with a sacrifice by singled in the fifth that's Rich Lett and now he's the uh, one of the managers or I guess you could say one of the managers right now right in the left of your screen and he's telling Asanski to hold Wally Backman on at first base because Wally's just pinch hitting or pinch running for Hernandez. Oh, Backman the runner at first. That's looking for an extra base hit and a run to score all the way from first base. He's one to tie here in the bottom of the 10th inning. And it drives a deep right field. It's going, going, and it's gone goodbye. And the Mets win it on Strawberry two run home run in the 10th inning. believe what we've just seen. right after this word from AT&T. Coming up next on a late edition of the News at 10, New Yorkers get two big scares. An underground explosion during rush hour shakes Water Street when it is packed with pedestrians. And an office building fire midday forces hundreds from their offices. Plus, the Carnegie Deli asked the question, who's the best Jewish mother? We'll have that Mother's Day report. And the devil's very important night on the ice. It's all coming up next on a late edition of the News at 10. Stay tuned. Well, Rob Kiner along with Tim McCarver, Steve Sabrisky, and Rusty Staub, and the Mets winning their first extra inning ball game of the year. You still don't believe it, huh? I'm going to have to pinch you <laughs> to see if this thing is for real or not. I really do I mean, you know, there are certain times in the game you figure out, uh, you know, the other ball club is, is one, the other ball club, the Cincinnati Reds, Sabo's got the tying hit, the winning hit, things are on the board, and you don't, you don't give up or anything like that. And Franco like pitching, he's yeah, so Fran tough. Yeah, Franco, and he, he retires five in a row with two left-handers up, you just feel like the writing's not on the wall for the Mets. Amazingly, after he got the first two batters out, helped out in a good play on the drive by Tuffle. He then walks Keith Hernandez, a left-hand batter, on four pitches to set it up for Daryl Strawberry. His first pitch to Strawberry, a fastball, and Daryl took it downtown. His ninth home run of the year, and the Mets come from behind to win it, and a great ball game. I mean, the Mets are doing everything they can uh, to win, but tonight's ball game, I mean, it was just shocking, and it's got to be shocking to the Cincinnati Reds because here uh, Pete Rose loses the appeal today, and now the game-winning home run when they got this game wrapped up and you know as well as I do Ralph there's some games you got wrapped up you got your best out there and when something like that happens that could ruin you for the next week they fought back from a 2-0 deficit tied it up a 2-2 and then went ahead 3-2 with the home run by Zabel and then the Mets on the two-run home run by Strawberry coming back to win it we'll be back with more of the recap in just a moment right after we tell you about the Budweiser star of the game 
And that Budweiser star of the game is Wally Backlund. <laughs> yeah, Wally was the pinch runner scoring in front of Strawberry. You're kidding, right? <laughs> Wally coming in to be the pinch runner for Keith Hernandez. After he walked, he scores the tying run, and Daryl Strawberry <laughs> is the star of the game as he won it with the home run in the bottom of the 10th inning with two men out off of John Franco. So the Mets winning the ball game by a score of four to three. A great baseball game here at Shea. And the unbelievable thing, Ralph, is the ball hit the bottom of the scoreboard. And that, you know, it was a long blow. It wasn't windblown. It was not windblown. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you. Anyway, New York Mets baseball has been brought to you by Budweiser. Beachwood Age for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. By Nissan Cars and Trucks, built for the most important race of all the human race. By Manufacturers Hanover, the financial source worldwide. By Express Mail, next day service from the post office. By RC Cola, some people will go out of their way for the taste of RC. By the New Jersey Bell Yellow Pages, the one that works. And by your local Sunoco dealer, who offers you new Sunoco Ultra 94, the highest octane under the sun. Our guests this evening will receive the professional home protection starter kit by Black & Decker. Compliment the True Value Hardware Stores and Home Centers. Fans, be with us again on Sunday when the Mets take on the Cincinnati Reds at 1.30 p.m. right here on WWOR-TV. The executive producer of Mets Baseball 88 is Rick Miner, produced and directed by Jeff Mitchell. The associate producer, Steve Olbaum, and the associate directors, Tom Shaffery and Steve Olbaum. The announcers on the preceding telecast were approved and contracted for by Sterling Doubleday Enterprises. And Mets Baseball is a production of Channel 9 Sports. Good evening, everybody.